Good morning and welcome to Gun Violence in New York City Neighborhoods, a series of panel discussions to explore complementary solutions from the law enforcement and public health fields, generously sponsored by the John A. Reisenbach Foundation. Uh, I'm Dan Stageman, I'm the research director here at John Jay College and this is, I believe, our final event in our spring 2017 initiative, uh, America's Gun Epidemic which is an interdisciplinary series exploring the many facets of gun violence in the United States. Uh, as some of you, I imagine, know already, uh, this initiative ran up against our winter weather this year, another act of God. Uh, two of our highest profile events, our mayor's panel and a book talk featuring ghetto side author Jill Leovi, uh, were scheduled for what turned out to be our blizzards this year and, and canceled as a result. Uh, so you can read into that whatever cosmic significance you will, but uh, in any case, we're ending strong t with today's conversation. I'd like to briefly frame the issue that our experts are here to discuss today. Uh, New York City is often featured, and rightly so, as a great success story in the history of American gun violence. From a firearms homicide rate in the thousands through the 1980s and into the 1990s, that was reduced in 2016, and it's actually surprisingly difficult to get accurate statistics on this for recent years, but I'm willing to bet our experts will, uh, will school me on that. The number was closer to 220 in 2016, out of a total of some 450 murders for the year. Who's got exact statistics for me on that? Anyone? No? Um, that's an 80% plus reduction from its peak. And, the, and one of the lowest per capita murder rates and gun homicide rates in the country. The reasons for these reductions are manifold uh, and still very much under study. But some of the frequently discussed causes include stricter gun laws here in New York City, targeted law enforcement efforts, community policing, uh, NYPD officers spend com comparatively a lot less time cruising the streets in their cars than police in other cities do, and uh, city investment in public health interventions, like the Cure Violence intervention that you'll hear more about today. Still, while this success story gives New Yorkers much to celebrate, New York City's current vo gun violence rates dwarf those in comparable European cities, say. Uh, London's rate, for, for instance, is consistently in the low double digits. So New York City's 200 or more gun homicides and hundreds of non-fatal shootings cause untold harm, and that harm is visited disproportionately on New York City's communities of color, as are the harms associated with criminal justice responses to gun violence. So how did we get here? And how do we continue to reduce gun violence in New York City and the myriad harms associated with it? Well, that's what we're here to discuss today. So some practical concerns before I introduce our first panel. Uh, today's program consists of two expert panels of 75 minutes each, followed by a luncheon. Uh, the flow of the conversation is in the hands of our talented moderators, uh, but generally each panelist is going to get about 10 minutes to discuss their work, followed by 20 to 25 minutes of moderator-guided discussion, and finally another 20 to 25 minutes of audience question and answer. Uh, and because we are being recorded, uh, we'll ask questioners to use a microphone, I guess this one. Um, so without further ado, here's our first panel, uh, which is made up of Reisenbach fundees and focuses on solutions and innovations from the law enforcement field. Um, I will leave it to you to read the full bios in your program. But starting on my left, we have Lieutenant Mark Moreno, uh, who is an NYPD officer. He began his career with the New York uh, police Department in February 1994 and is, has been the Crime Stoppers Unit Commander in the Detective Bureau since November 2016. Uh, to Lieutenant Moreno's right is Greg Roberts, who is Executive Director for the New York City Police Foundation, a position he's held since, uh, sorry, for which he's worked since 1980. Uh, Next is Danny Peralta, who is Executive Managing Director of the Point Community Development Corporation, a nonprofit youth development uh, organization in the Hunts Point section of the South Bronx. And finally, our moderator, uh, Rick Curtis, who's a Professor of Anthropology here at John Jay and currently our Chair of the Law and Police Sciences Department. So give our experts a hand. Yeah.
Well, I guess let me start off. Um, you're going to go first, or who's? Well, I'm not sure which you prepare to go first, but uh, I don't have a preference. Um, but essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to have the, the gentleman uh, say their piece. We'll have some Q and A at some point, uh, so everybody's going to have a chance to ask questions and um, interject your opinions. And so, hopefully, it'll be lively. Uh, feel free to get up and get coffee if you need to enliven yourself. And um, you know, so here we go. So, gents, thank you so much. Sure. Well, as you wish. Uh, my name is Mark Moreno. Uh, I'm a lieutenant in New York City Police Department. Uh, I have been for 23 years. Uh, currently, I'm the commanding officer of the Crime Stoppers Unit, and uh, under my command follows the, uh, the Gun Stoppers Unit. Um, and basically, what we do is uh, encourage the community to uh, communicate information that they may have regarding specific crimes and illegal handguns. And uh, we try to identify uh, where these wanted persons who committed some of these heinous crimes that you see on the news uh, quite often. Additionally, we ask them to uh, notify us if they have any information on illegal firearms that people may have. Uh, we use an incentive-based program that's financed by the police foundation. Uh, we offer rewards for crimes up to $2,500 for some of the most serious crimes. Um, and we'll offer a, a reward of you know $500 for, for some information. Uh, we found that you can ask the public uh, for their help, and they'll give it to you quite often. But offering a reward kind of opens up a much, uh, a much larger uh, group of people who are willing to then tell you what you uh, may need to know. Um, both programs utilize uh, the reward concept. Uh, they're entirely funded by the Police Foundation. Uh, Gun Stoppers uh, offers a $1,000 uh, reward for anonymous tips. Uh, we do it anonymously, obviously, because people in their community don't want to be outed by others. Uh, and this, again, is another incentive that uh, we offer them. Uh, anonymous reporting of crime is far more attractive to people than having to uh, identify yourself. Um, crime Stoppers has been instrumental uh, in solving crime uh, we received over 3,000 tips in 2016, uh, and since 1983, uh, we've solved over 1,500 homicides. Uh, the foundation has paid out over $2 million to uh, our tip team. Uh, Gunstop, uh, it's a great program, and last year alone, uh, we received approximately 700 tips. Uh, it's an integral part of uh, the department's plan to rid the city of illegal firearms. Um, and we do always allow our tipsters to remain anonymous, even when they're collecting their reward. Uh, they get a code name, code number, and they can collect uh, cash. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I have on uh, gun stoppers and crime stoppers in our efforts to, uh, to control firearms. Um, let's take a few minutes for questions and uh, comments and answers, I guess, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, actually, if I, I could start off with a question. I, um, on the front page of today's New York Times, there's a story about a new initiative that the NYPD wants to roll out. You're going to talk about that? I don't want to steal yeah. your thunder. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> um, my question really is, is a bit specific. Could I? Yeah, could maybe, maybe if I gave my background, because I was going to set this up. Oh, okay. I think this is more to talk about what's, what's relevant now, because I think uh, if we talk about the broad policing, you'll understand how guns are addressed as part of the broad policing tactic historically and right now with their priorities coming on. So the police foundation is sort of the bridge between the police. <laughs> That's why I'm avoiding the mic. That's <laughs> All right, so the police foundation was started in 1971 at the time of the Knapp Commission. Anybody remember that? Anybody know that? Right here, Serpico days. Right, that's right, John Jay was involved with that. So those were the Serpico days. It was part of a broad-based uh, investigation into citywide corruption. So the police foundation was formed in that climate to be a hedge against corruption. It was a, a legitimate vehicle for businesses and individuals to um, thank the police department, if you will, and get involved with the department. 
So it's grown over the years to become a very active and strategic program development uh, operation. In the early days, it was scholarships. I think some of the first scholarships, like many of the commissioners, we did scholarships here. Uh, we did in the early days. Uh, they were going to get rid of the mounted unit in the 70s because of economics, and we kept the mounted unit going for, for decades. Uh, we did the first bulletproof vest in 1975. It was the first time that technology came on. And how we do things, we worked at that time with uh, Abney, which was Lou Rudin, and um, the PBA, and we formed a partnership to get the first 18,000 vests for the police department. And how it works, after that legislation was passed to provide vests as uh, standard equipment moving forward, because we can't fund things into perpetuity. All that, that is changing. That is changing. So that was in the 70s. In the 80s, we took over Crime Stoppers. Crime Stoppers started in the Southwest. They put a case on TV, a cold case that had no uh, leads on it. And people uh, watched this on TV. It sparked their memory. And it led to calls that helped the police solve this cold case. And now it operates around the globe, all around the globe. Hundreds of cities in, in, in the United States. And Guam has a Crime Stoppers. Australia's got a Crime Stoppers. I don't even know you, you know this. They, they, they don't take the money in Australia. They all just do it because they, they call in and they want to be good Samaritans in, uh, in Australia. And interesting, all across Crime Stoppers all around the globe, two-thirds of the money is picked up and one-third of the money is not picked up. Maybe some of our clients are uh, detained at the time in Rikers or perhaps somewhere else and can't get the money, but that's how it works. Who knows about crime? Who's going to be calling you? people who are inside? So we, took, we did that in the 80s, and then in the 90s, we became the Modern Police Foundation. When Commissioner Kelly came, I remember sitting with him. It was, the smoke was still in the sky. It was November after the 9-11 attacks, and we told Commissioner Kelly, there's more support than ever before for the police, so think big. Think big. We can probably get a lot of money for your, for your programs. And um, to his vision and foresight, he, he recognized it at that time the department had to change. They had to set up counter-terrorist operations. A police department set up counter-terrorist operations. So we did that. At that time, we started a program called International Liaison. We now have 12 investigators assigned to uh, terrorist hotspots around the world, gathering intelligence, counter-terrorism intelligence to protect New York City. At the beginning, that program was uh, caused concerns for some of the other agencies. The FBI and the CIA were saying, why, why does the New York City Police Department have people on our turf doing this? Well, our, our detectives were the first one at the London subway bombing, got information directly back to, to New York City, where they deployed resources accordingly to what happened there, and went have instant action based on that real-time information to protect New York City. And I think we're still waiting for the official report from the federal government on that attack. So that's why we were doing it then. And it's grown in, to become so popular now that some of these turf battles no longer exist. They no, they're no longer concerned about this. And to the point where our detectives were in Paris, we sent our guys who were there and the old detectives who were in Paris before went there. They were the lead detectives there. They were the ones who had more data than anybody. They went to Belgium and told the Belgian uh, officials about these individuals had ties up there. So our, our intelligence now is second to none because of that program. And we have related programs that work on that project as well, where we have analysts who take this data either from our um, liaisons overseas or looking at Al Jazeera or all sorts of open source information and prepare the briefings for the police commissioner every day. So we've got a tremendous infrastructure for counterterrorism here that the Police Foundation is helping support. And the other thing that Commissioner Kelly described at that time in, uh, I guess it was 2002, was the need to uh, modernize the police department's technology. You know, he said, we're a typical uh, large organization. We don't know what we know. Uh, a lot of their data was not digitized. It was, it was in the head of detective like you. And if once you left, a lot of intelligence went with you. So it became, and he described something, he said, kind of like a NORAD system with screens and everything like that. So we built uh, the real-time crime center, a huge wall like this with all screens and all. So that was the screening room, and then that led to building a data warehouse that is now the real-time crime center that is the basis of the new real-time crime. So basically what it was like, a, like a, an NYPD Google, 
you know. So they took all the data that detectives knew and things and created search engines. Some of the search engines they would get from private industries like uh, the credit card companies. So if we're looking for you, we would find out, well, you know him or you know her, and where you're going to be hiding. You can be with him or her, so we'll find you like that. Or some of the other things would be like a, a tattoo database or a, nick, uh, a nickname database. There was one case we always used. There was a, a Sparrows in, 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 uh, in the village, and the guy robbed it, and he had a little silver revolver, and he had a, a tattoo on his neck that said sugar. So they put him through the, the database, the, 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 the tattoo and nickname, and they found like 499 hits of sugar, and they were all uh, working women. And he was the only guy in there, and they, they found him with a robbery history there, and they were able to get him that, like that. So that's sort of like the modern policing. And the other one that we did prior to that that people think is more technology is Comstat. So we got the first computer for Comstat. When Bill Braden was here the first time, in 1993, he said to his team, get me the, uh, uh, the crime statistics. And they said to him, okay, Commissioner, the next quarterly statistics will come out in June. So in 1993, NYPD did not have a, a, a computerized system to track and analyze crime. You know, that pins in the wall here, and that's when you had the pins. That's when they had the pins. Uh, so we got him, uh, I remember, it was like a $10,000 uh, HP 386 that we bought them, and that started what has really changed policing around the world, much to the detriment of precinct commanders like yourself, thank you. you're welcome, you know. So what they did was, all of a sudden they had all the data. They, they would have all the data and they would, bring precinct, they would bring precinct commanders down, precinct by precinct, you'd be there with all your peers from your borough, so you're the precinct commander, but this is the 20th precinct. So on this screen they would have a pin map, electronic pin map. Show me all the murders on Columbus Avenue. Show me all the robberies on, on Amsterdam Avenue. What are you doing about it? And they really held people accountable. And out of that process came all of the modern strategies that changed those numbers that you were referring to when we went from 2,300 murders to, what are we under now? We're under 500 murders now. But it began at that time in 93, and this miraculous decline continues, right? So those are the old days, where we are now and we do crime stoppers, we do gun stoppers, but my point is the policing tactics that started then, and actually they're changing as we speak. When Commissioner Bratton came back this time and O'Neill was put into this process of re-engineering the department, which is something that we funded to take a snapshot of the department, where are we going now? They knew. Bratton used to talk about it. Crime is the lowest it's ever been. But Cops are not happy, and the community's not happy. What's going on? So they knew they had to change some of their tactics. Uh, there have been a lot of political and uh, media issues over stopping question. They kind of changed how they were doing those, and they reduced the stops, and the crime continues to go down. But what they're doing now, uh, which we'll set the stage for what we'll talk about now, is, is setting up a neighborhood policing model. So part of what was going on in, in the uh, uh, past administration that did reduce crime, but as some people discuss, you know, perhaps contributed to some of the, the tensions with the community that are apparent now locally and nationally. So one of the things that was going on was uh, there was something called impact zone. So in the, all the high crime precincts were de determined to be impact zone and they would send all the new recruits out of the police academy into these impact zones to saturate them with manpower. Uh, that's the good news, but the bad news was some of the young kids there did not have the training, the experience, or some of the interactive skills to handle um, those neighborhoods and the direction that they, were giving, that they were given to do a lot of stops. And when you do a stop, you, give out a, you have to fill out a form called 250. So fill out a 250, fill out a 250, fill out a 250. And that became part of the Comstat numbers-driven system that was going on. So you had two things going on. You had a numbers-driven system there, because the people who set up Comstat knew that you have to refresh these metrics over time. Otherwise, these numbers will kill you, and you have to really look at what you're accomplishing rather than just driving numbers, driving numbers. And then they started looking at how to change that now. So they changed these impact zones. They started getting the new cops field training officers, mentors, what a concept. You know, you would think that everybody does that. Every corporation does that. 
but they were not doing that. So now the, U the new cops get field training officers, and we also set up partners in the community to uh, orient them to the to di diverse cultures of the community. Then they set up neighborhood policing, and this is going to get to your point in one second. Neighborhood policing changed the way they do patrol. This is not community policing of the past. This is not just a, a small program. This is changing their entire operation. Uh, they knew that the 911 system was the best thing ever, and the worst thing that ever happened to the police department. It just ruled. You get in your car and you drive around, drive around, you're saying, maybe not in some other cities, but that's still ruled the patrol force. So neighborhood policing now, they're pulling officers off of 911 duties. They're backfilling them, because actually the 911 calls are not suffering from any uh, uh, you know, increased length in time for these calls to come in. Uh, because they backfill it, they have the resource to backfill the 911 calls. But you now work in your sector. A precinct's broken up to like six sectors, A, B, C, D, E, and E. And you used to be in sector A, but then you would travel here, and you would travel here, and you would travel here, and travel. Now you stay in that sector, you work there every day, you get to know the people, and 30% of your time is devoted towards building these contacts with the community and um, solving the problems collaboratively. They knew they had a trust problem. In order to reduce crime further, you have to build trust in the community. There are certain neighborhoods where, the, where people will not call 911. That's why Crime Stoppers does well. It's anonymous. But that's a problem. If people are not calling 911, what do you got? So this is the challenge now, to build trust, to further reduce crime. We have to build that relationship. So that's the new operating program. We can talk more about how that will work so that we can fill the next 25 minutes. But to his point, we have to measure that. We had to measure that. If we're going to get into a whole new world, of policing, we're taking a corporate approach towards this now. How do you measure the results? So we, we funded this survey that you read about in the Times today. Uh, they're calling it a sentiment meter. We, we're working with people who you know, do this you know, in your world, either the advertising world or the political world, uh, and they've had great experience doing that. And they're measuring the sentiment, the level of trust in the precincts, and giving this to the precinct commanders in real time now. So the precinct commanders can see what's trending on 79th Street, people up there are trending up, trending down. You can have access to read all the uh, open source Twitter and Facebook uh, rumblings that are going around the precinct. You can find all this data that's going on there. And we also turn this into new way to measure. Because how do you measure? How do you measure community interaction? You know, we can measure how many times you talk to someone there, but how do you measure a, uh, uh, a productive community interaction? It's something that people all around the world, the Army is looking to do that. How do you measure swaying hearts and minds? So that's what that survey is about today. Uh, we can come back to this, how this will affect uh, gun enforcement and all crime enforcement as we move forward. Um, so let me just mention that the question that we had, it, I, I was in class right before I came here, and we were talking about a website that's popular among students called ratemyprofessor.com, right? And students are very familiar with this website. and. Uh, the comment in class is that, you know, the only students that go onto that website to fill out, you know, the comments about a professor are the ones that either hate the professor or the ones that love the professor. The vast majority in the middle don't really bother with the rate my professor, you know. They, they feel neither here nor there about it, you know. So the question that was, that was raised in class is that if the NYPD starts shooting out um, email um, text message questions, over the course of the day, like, you know, how do you feel now? How do you feel the NYPD is doing a good job? It will be like the rate my professor effect, right? The ones that think they're doing a wonderful job will respond, and the ones that think don't think it will not, you know, will also respond. But the ones in the middle were like, eh, you know. You know, so I don't know. I mean, um, not that we shouldn't do it. No, I'm but, not, we're not, not suggesting that. that but not only that. So some of the polling is being done like a, a pop-up on your phone to fill out a survey. Who's doing that? I mean, that, that's a skewed population to begin with. I mean, I wouldn't do that, right? So part of what, what you're saying is very true. And you know, all of these polls, as we saw by the most recent election, you know, they're flawed. They're well, flawed. we were struck by the, we were struck by it in my class because the students in the class at summer who are sitting here in the front row um, have done a survey uh, this semester where they have to go and uh, interview 10 people that they know. So family, friends, their network members, if you will. And essentially asking the very same questions. You know, do you think the police are doing a good job? Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe at night? Um, so it's very interesting. We'll be very interested to compare our findings, which we've been collecting since 2012, 
and we've got maybe 20,000 responses now. And we had 1,500 responses this semester. Um, with the ones that the, that the NYPD gets from this kind of method, I, I'm very curious to see how, how well they match. Um, but I'm very heartened to see that they're, they're going um, in this electronic kind of new world. I think it's a really good move for the NYPD to begin to collect some more um, deep dive data, if you will, about police community relations. So we can't feel anything but good about um, this. We, we have the anecdotal, you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, analysis is more uh, qualitative than quantitative, but we're going to establish some metrics for it. But, but related to what you, what you were saying, the, re the real goal now is with this neighborhood policing that's in now over the half the precinct, the department recognizes this sort of dialogue is necessary. And again, let me be very clear. The goal is to continue to reduce crime. This is not just a... So let me ask this good. question then, that, which is the real question, given that this panel is about gun violence. Could that method of polling the community gain any pertinent information about... I don't know about the polling, but the program itself. The program itself, once we build the relationships, and you, you raise a good point before, because the police department tends to um, speak to the same people, that precinct council meeting, the same people there. You know, and, and the target audience that we need to reach are not the people that are going to come to the precinct and discuss these things. So our whole goal now, the real goal of this program now is, because that's just the metric side, it's just the polling part, but the real goal of the program, you're going to be hearing about this in days to come, there are going to be meetings in every precinct, there's going to be a huge media campaign to get the public to understand this new way of policing and engage. It's a, it's a public engagement campaign. And there is a shared responsibility component to that because if the community doesn't embrace this and get involved, it's not going to work. So what we're really trying to do is reach out beyond the normal uh, suspects, if you will, and get into populations that we haven't dealt with before. And that's the role that the foundation can play very well with because we have different contexts in the community and we're trying to get community structures involved more and more. People like the Brownsville Criminal Justice Center are becoming our partners. We need partners in the community to spread the word out there and get the community involved. It can't be, here's the, the new NYPD brought to you by the NYPD. So part of the communication campaign that we're doing, in addition to mass media, is getting the young people and the people in the community to share their own stories about this and put our, on their own social media and share it that way. So it's two components. The polling will try to measure some of the sentiment, but the real work is going to be developing real relationships in the neighborhood with people who, who have not traditionally had dialogue with the police. Well, I don't know if you've, any of you have ever seen it, but whenever you get, no matter how hostile a person is or anti-police they are, when you get them together with cops, you've seen this many times, you know, and once you get through the, the venting or some of the uh, uh, perceptions that people have based on the climate we're in, um, they leave friends. It happens every time. It happens every time. Reasonable people always will meet in the middle there. And as Tim was saying, it's, a, it's hard to hate someone you know. So that's part of what we're trying to do uh, on a local level and succeeding very well on a local level, but we have to get this out to the mass. So, sorry, uh, can I ask that we hear from Danny at this point? Because I think that's a great segue into his yeah, work. I was thinking that too. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thank you again um, for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to come from a different angle. I don't, um, I don't do policing, <laughs> um, so I have very few statistics on that particular um, work that we do. Um, but again, I represent the Point Community Development Corporation. Um, since 1994, we've been at the front lines of revitalizing the Hunts Point community in the South Bronx. Uh, we work obviously in Hunts Point, but we work with other um, neighborhoods, surrounding neighborhoods, Longwood, Mount Haven. We get young people from Soundview. Uh, from a lot of these different communities that are very similar. Um, you know, I'm not sure what people's perception of Hunts Point is in the South Bronx, um, but we've been trying to change that perception from within for many years now. And our work really um, challenges, again, the norms um, that some of our young people and, and just the community in general have, even though themselves. Um, you know, so our work is, uh, you know, again, revitalizing the community in three main areas. Uh, we use the tools of arts and culture, we use youth development and leadership, and then we do a lot of work around environmental justice. And these are the things, these are the tools, these are the entry points, I think, for some of our community members um, to see themselves as leaders, 
um, to actually make a change in the community. And so we offer programming for young people um, in those hours, again, when they get out of school, primarily the 3 to 9 p.m., I'll give them something to do. Uh, one of the things that we find is that young people obviously are seeking uh, something to do, right? They, they want to be um, constructive in some ways. It totally depends, again, on mentoring and the ability to, to, to find other networks um, to be able to, again, address violence, but also to have an alternative to violence. So that's most of our work. You know, most of the work that we do is we bring a young person in, we ask them what is it that they want out of our community center, and then we also ask them what do they want to contribute to the community, right? So it's not just about uh, collecting services and coming in and, and being a part of what we do, it's also contributing to that culture, right? So there's a, there's a direct impact that we find uh, when young people, again, are creating, uh, when they're coming in and they're using their hands, you know, to do stewardship programming, for example, um, some of the community gardens that we have, or building, uh, painting murals. Um, we're talking about young people that are being trained as other youth development um, um, specialists, so they're actually working with the younger youth um, and training them and mentoring them. And again, there's a direct connection we find um, with having the space for young people, again, to be creative, to be safe, um, to, and then again, the direct relation to them and their ability to not commit violent acts. And that could look like a lot of things, you know, um, for us in our community. It can look like obviously gun violence, but it looks like, you know, um, abuse at home. I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, unhealthy relationships. You know, we bring those topics up to young people. Um, I was speaking to Ms. Ashley earlier. Um, what is the, the how, do, how, are you, how are we talking to young people about the use of social media? where a lot of violence is, is being born and spread. Um, you know, an emoji can get you killed in our community, believe it or not. Um, so how do we address that? And again, we're really on the front lines listening to the young people, listening to the families, um, paying attention to the statistics um, to understand, again, where are the trends and how do we impact that? Um, and then, again, how do we work with partnership in doing that, right? One of the things that we are, you know, pride ourselves is that we don't do this work alone, right? If you're going to revitalize a community, it takes a lot of stakeholders across the board. And everybody has to be at least amicable, all right, enough <laughs> to be at the same table most of the time um, so that we can speak about these issues candidly. And again, to your point, right, you can't hate people that you've gotten to know. And that's a big, big part of our work. It's about education. It's about leadership. But again, there's something to be said about the ability for young people to think critically and to do something. Um, tangible with their time. And so these are the things, you know, young people come into the point, they're able to do programming like black and white photography in a dark room uh, with a collaboration with the International Center of Photography, which is a program that I came from originally. And I came in just to do black and white photography for three hours on a Saturday, maybe 12, 13 years ago, and now I'm the executive director of the organization. Um, so again, these opportunities, right? Um, you're looking at dance classes, you're looking at stewardship. Again, that's a very big part of our work. How do we get young people to directly change the dynamics of their neighborhood. One, you know, by growing food, um, by doing community cleanups, um, by being out there, again, mentoring other young people. Um, very, very important to our work. Um, we're doing things innovative at this point, things like um, uh, community Wi-Fi, where we're building a, a community-wide free Wi-Fi for the whole community, right? Our community um, does not have, some of the community members do not have the resources uh, to pay the exorbitant fees that um, some of these communications companies offer, um, I mean, excuse me, charge for the services. So we're actually building a system that young people are building. Um, they're actually creating the nodes, they're, they're installing them, and they're creating this Wi-Fi network. Again, some young people that didn't know that they wanted to be um, digital stewards, much less enter into a tech field. You know, so these are the entry points that we do. And again, we see success in a lot of different ways from young people. Um, you know, one of the things that we point to again is that it is an asset-based organization. Everybody has an individual role. You can learn, again, better yourself. Um, your self-esteem leads to a larger community self-esteem being built. And these are the entry points, again, that we invite young people to be a part of. And there's no right or wrong way. You can't fail at after-school programs. Um, you can't fail at building yourself up, at making a magazine, at, um, at developing photographs, at, at, at choreographing a dance for your community, you know? You can't fail at these things. And so these are the encouraging points that we enter into. Um, working with the you know, Reisenbach Foundation in the last year, um, they helped fund one of our, our major programs, which is our teen uh, program. And we have uh, an excellent uh, uh, program in the summer for six weeks where we train young people around leadership. And again, they're coming in, a lot of them fresh, they never had a job, much less thought about leadership, much less thought critically about the community. And we do things like community mapping, right? What does our community consist of? Who are the stakeholders? Um, where, where, again, where are you in relation to these folks? And where are you, again, in relation to help building your community up? And we enter into these conversations. And again, the outcome is typically, we know we do a big, large showcase for the community where these young people, again, they learn how to play the guitar, or they learn how to paint, or they learn how to um, organize. 
Um, and they're out there doing that. You know, they're paying it forward. And these, again, are the types of activities that we enter into with young people. Some of the young people come for a couple of weeks. Some of them come, again, for a number of years. And we see a transformation. If you come to the point for one day, um, if you did a workshop, let's say, in social circus, you're going to be changed somehow. Maybe you learn how to juggle. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe, uh, um, you know, maybe you start thinking about occupational therapy. And maybe that's an entry point for you to maybe get higher education in that field. So these are the things, again, that we do. It is very highly mentorship-based. Again, it's very highly individual. Um, young people come in. Again, we try to match them up with, a, with, a, with an adult staff, again, that can help follow them um, in their engagement. Um, you know, this, uh, this summer um, and this fall, actually, this winter, you know, we also dealt with some of the blizzards. But we were trying to put together this art exhibit um, called Mi Casa es Mi Casa. And it's a, it's a, it's a largely um, a lot of young people that submitted work. So we have maybe like 20 young artists from, from all over the world, actually. And this is part of a larger initiative that we've been doing now uh, as a result of violence. Uh, we lost one of our, our community members, a young man. His name was Glenn Wright on uh, September 13, 2009. Um, he was murdered senselessly in the, in the Lower East section. Um, he was cleaning his, uh, excuse me, Lower East side, I'm sorry. He was uh, cleaning his grandmother's window when he was attacked and stabbed um, and, he, and he perished. Um, and, and the catalyst for that was his friends and family are getting together for one, doing therapy, very important, right? We were able to, we, we had to process this loss and we had to become empowered. And in the process of understanding our grief and understanding again the power that we even had with that, um, we developed something called the House of Spoof. And the House of Spoof Collective now, you know, it's a whole bunch of different artists from all over the city, mainly young people who have been curating art shows, again, in, in, in celebration of Glenn Wright's life. And uh, so this past, uh, we were supposed to do it in the fall, but again, we had bad weather. This past February, we had an opening. Again, several hundred people um, were directly impacted by this, uh, this, this exhibit that was up. And it talk, mainly talked about displacement in our communities and how people are addressing displacement, because that's a big issue in our community right now. Um, but obviously, again, it was empowering. And it gave, again, people that were typically maybe disempowered because of violence an opportunity, to, again, to lift themselves up and, again, see themselves as catalysts for change and not just be sorrowful. And again, some, some of this work, again, I, I can have a million examples of how it works for us directly, but it is, again, um, in tandem with a lot of different groups. And it's very important for us to, again, look at the way the community looks at itself and how the community intends to address its own issues um, as much as possible. Okay, before we uh, open it up to the audience, I just want to comment that we've heard about some wonderful programs uh, on behalf of the NYPD, community programs in Hunts Point, but I do want to refocus this on the problem rather than the solutions because gun violence is a problem. I mean, I'm a resident of the 73rd Precinct for 27 years, the Brownsville, all right? And I can remember when I moved in in January 1990 um, that it was automatic gunfire every night, right? I don't have the automatic gunfire every night. That stopped really in 93, the, the year it started going down. The automatic gunfire stopped every night. But I still hear it quite often. I do. And, and last year, I had a couple of murders on my block. So this is not an infrequent occurrence to me. And I hear the gunfire very fre frequently. So despite all of the good programs that we have going on, there's still a problem out there. And I think that we need to talk more about that and what's driving the problem. What drove the problem back when I first moved to the 73rd Precinct was crack and open air gun mark, uh, uh, drug markets. That's really not the case today, but I think that we need to have a bit of a discussion about the factors which are driving gun violence. Um, drugs are still there, obviously, but there's other factors I think that perhaps we should talk about. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I wanna mention uh, is that uh, in Hunts Point that, you know, wonderful things going on there. Also, there's like Ruben Austria up there who's doing the Community Connections for Youth program, which is, you know, similar kind of thing. So there's a lot of um, focus on youth in the South Bronx. However, I have to point out that the, the two youth detention facilities in New York City, one's located in the South Bronx, Crossroads, right there on, you know, Westchester and 150th or something, right? Um, so that's not really a good thing. And uh, the New York Times, not to tout the New York Times, but they did do a very large series on murder in the 4-0, right? And they, they went through every single murder in the 4-0, and there were some really heartbreaking ones uh, that they described there. And honestly, we've been go I've been going there every Sunday with uh, 20, 30 students at a time to address some of the conditions right where they want to build the new 4-0 precinct, in fact. The property, you know, 
designated for the NYPD is the biggest open air drug market in New York City. It's right there. So, um, you know, the fact that we have to go there as private citizens and address a, a problem that's driving crime and violence uh, and it's been there for 40 years unaddressed is appalling to me. But you know what? If we don't step up as private citizens and do something about it, we can't really wait for government to solve our problems because they won't. You know, so this is, Republicans should be very happy with me right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but it's true. I'm not waiting for the government to go and solve this problem. And we've been going with groups of students every Sunday for the last uh, nine months, really, to address what has become a vector for crime and disease in the South Bronx. And for 40 years, no one's done anything effective about that. And, you know, we figure it's got to change. So uh, I want to talk about the problem here a little bit. So if any of you have any questions or comments, uh, now would be the time. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, Lieutenant, um, please share with us uh, the NYPD's evaluation of the acoustic um, this technology used to detect, to pinpoint where gunshots are originating from. I understand there's some neighborhoods that have this uh, uh, modern technology. Uh, and will it be expanded to other neighborhoods? Uh, yeah. you're, you're talking about the shot spotter uh, technology that the department putting all over the city. Um, obviously, uh, ShotSpotter started in communities where there was more gun violence. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to put uh, ShotSpotter in the 19th precinct uh, to start it. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been instrumental for the department to have ShotSpotter. Uh, now, uh, in the past, uh, when you worked in these commands and you had shots fired, you didn't have any information, so there was nothing to investigate. Now, with the technology they have with ShotSpotter, you can go to that exact location. You can find ballistics. You can trace those ballistics back. You have a specific gun. You recover that gun later on. Uh, it all leads to, to uh, you know, getting some of those guns off the street. So ShotSpotter is, uh, you know, an integral part of the department's effort to uh, fight gun violence uh, right now. Will we see it expanded throughout the whole city? You know, the department's expanding it slowly. It's going to expand uh, first and foremost communities that need it, and then outward as, uh, as we move forward. Correct. People weren't calling 911, but now you have a, a record of a, a shot spotter, and you can send resources to those locations. You have repeat locations. Evan. Yeah. Um, so I would like to ask um, the two representatives from the police foundation and, and the police department what they think about. Um, addressing civilian complaints as a means to um, civilian complaints in in these more uh, or or less um, involved neighborhoods as a means to build trust between the police department and and the community at large. I think uh, the the gentleman from the foundation correctly pointed out that this that Operation Impact had a had a large impact in an, in an un, unforeseen way in eroding that trust between, um, between the community and the police department because so many youth were stopped, you, you know, back in 2010, 2011 um, during, these, during these massive sweeps. And so I'm wondering if, there's, if there are concrete ways that the police department is looking at to build that trust and what they're doing to measure the increasing trust. Department, the department sort of 180 from uh, the time frame you're speaking of. You know, it, it, there was a time when crime fighting was directed through stops, and that's what we did. Now, with neighborhood policing, uh, they're trying to kind of reverse that trend. Uh, get the cops in the sectors to get to know you. Hopefully, that cuts down on civilian complaints. Hopefully, uh, the police officers assigned to these, these communities start to know the people. Uh, and, and I think that's the, the forefront of the department right now is community relations. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. I, I, it's a different, completely different job. So I, I just wanted to ask a question since I've got the mic in my hand. Um, there's a lot of conversation now about listening to the community and having these lines of dialogue open. I'd like to get a, a sense from, from Danny uh, 
how does that play out with the point right now? Is, th is there a presence there that you see from law enforcement? And is that a positive thing? And if so, how? Yeah. Um, you know, we've had, uh, I would say, a contentious relationship at, all, at times with the police department, um, particularly around stop and frisk. Um, you know, uh, for a time we've, and even to this day, we still educate our young people around what their rights are, um, how to interact with police, because we do see a lot of those stops still happening in our community. Um, we actually have, uh, ironically, we actually have a great relationship with our community officers. Um, they actually support a lot of the events that we do, a lot of the en endeavors that we try to enter into. Um, they make sure that we get our permits, that we're safe when we're doing these kinds of activities. Um, again, it depends who you're talking to. You know, some of our young people who, again, have engaged in some of these workshops, understand how to engage with the police, they probably have a better time communicating with police if they do get stopped. Um, but we've seen, again, young people that have gotten arrested. And we've intervened in some instances. There's a couple of high schools around the way um, that we've, uh, that, that right, on, right on Hunts Point Ave and, and on Lafayette. And in the times, you know, in the middle of the day, maybe there's some truancy going on. And so we've seen the police maybe coming up to the young people and maybe about to arrest them or maybe take them back to school. And we've intervened in the situations, again, where we know that it might be escalating, you know, where, where we see the young people kind of getting upset and there's this back and forth coming out. Um, and so we say, you know what, we, you know, we're members of the community and we talk to the police in a certain way, we talk to the young person in a certain way, and we try to defuse issues, you know? Um, but it's never an exact um, science. And again, you know, we don't, um, you know, we have a lot of things that happen in our community, again, that happen directly to us. We have to talk to the police. You know, when, when, when somebody, if there is to have violence in our community, we're not going to step in directly, obviously, because that's not our, our role, you know? Um, so we do have to call the police. So again, it totally has depended. But I would say that after the community um, policing piece, the neighborhood policing has happened, there's been a lot more of a walk-in from the police department. Again, they have a whole new team of community officers in our area directly, and we've seen them come in and out of our space now, I would say in the last six months more than in the last like eight years that I've been working there. So there is, I think, a different approach happening for sure. How that plays out, I like to see how it happens in the summer, to be honest with you. That's really where a lot of the things, issues come up and where we see a lot of those interactions with police um, and the young people that, again, are contentious in some ways, for sure. See, see the department, in the first time in my uh, memory, uh, recognizes the root issues, if you will, and recognizes that the work you're doing is really the answer, you know. If we can get young people involved in owning their community, or actually even more fundamental, staying in school and getting jobs, then it changes police work. And that's the goal of this administration, and that's the goal of this neighborhood policing thing. So uh, it's, it's taking a long time to take root in the neighborhoods. I'm glad you're, you're seeing your office. But we, we, we will work together now, because I'm looking for partners like this. The police, a good cop would like nothing better to, than to say, I see this kid over here. If I don't do anything with him, I'm going to be arresting him with a gun in a year. But if I can get him to work with you now, there's nothing better than that. And that, that's the goal now. But we need to build partners like that. And I think part of the other thing when you were saying, what is the problem, is that um, I think you were 100% right. Keep up the fight, because people have to own their neighbors and take them back now, because kind of we're on our own right now in this political climate. And. Uh, <laughs> But it's a, it's a good opportunity. It's a good opportunity to take back your neighborhood. So again, make the noise there. Make, and this police department will respond to that. They will respond to that. But it's more importantly is to really get the young people, if we could do anything for guns, to keep the kids out of the system and keep the kids active in the neighborhoods and all. And the more partnerships we have with, with, with operations like yours, the better. That's the whole deal. So we'll definitely be working with you in the 4 one over there. Because that's what we do now. And these neighborhood police, are, they're looking not only to have the resources like you, but also to, to make the relationships there and, and get this dialogue going, because people don't know about it. You guys are active. In it. Had, how many people knew about the neighborhood policing program before today? About half, about half. But it is a lot more extensive than just another catchphrase. It's not just a, another you know, name for a program. They, they're changing the way they operate. They're gonna have communication officers in the precinct working with the community on social media and communicating in the new world. You know, it's happening very fast. And quite frankly, they, they were behind in the times w as far as messaging. You know, you saw over the last couple of years, granted, we, we're all talking about some of the, uh, the, uh, the tactics that were a success in reducing crime, but were also uh, crit being criticized after that. Um, and that became a huge political issue, and it became a media issue. 
and it reached a, a, a point where um, the department was so behind in messaging what they were doing to make the change. The commissioner even talks about the low point of all this in political and media environment. Two officers were assassinated in their car as a result of that. So that showed the need. So we have to really change this dynamic and change the way they're getting their word out because there are a lot of good cops and good stories and now there's a structure in place to have this dialogue there. So that's where we're going. Uh, the first part of the question is, could you talk a little bit about how police officers are being measured, right? You mentioned that there's been a lot of talk about measuring and measuring very hard to do things, but generally the assessment of the quality of a police officer has been measured in different ways over the years, but currently, how are you thinking about doing that? The department utilizes, obviously, they, they evaluate officers just on a, on a yearly basis, but part of the new evaluations are their interactions so, you know, it, it's difficult to evaluate a police officer uh, simply based on what the public thinks of them. Uh, it's the best way I can put it. You know, if, if a whole community hates a police officer, or doesn't like, or is giving them civilian complaints, we want to automatically say he's a terrible cop. And the honest assessment is that's not always the case. He could be a guy who's out there, who's concerned for the people, who's targeting the right people. Now, do we know if the right people are the ones making those civilian complaints, are the ones who are rating this police officer, if you will, as a bad cop? So you have to take everything uh, and compare it. You know, who's comparing a cop? Is it a bad guy who's been arrested 50 times, a drug dealer? I is that the person that we're listening to? Is he the one making those civilian complaints? Or is it a good citizen, uh, a hardworking <coughs> person? So, I mean, you know, to evaluate a police officer in that sense, very difficult. Very difficult to just draw a, a black and white uh, scenario and say he's got a ton of civilian complaints. He's automatically a bad guy. It just it doesn't it doesn't add up. Uh, sometimes it's just the opposite. He's got a lot of civilian complaints, but he may be a good guy, a very good guy, and you'd be happy to have him in the community. Uh, so to answer your question, to measure him, you know, it's part of the the uh, the scale now for measuring uh, police officers. Is there some new So uh, I hope that. Well, it, it's certainly part of it, and it leads into the next part of this question. Anecdotally, people complain about interactions with their, their community police officer or other officials. They'll come to them and say, there's you know, this drug market on my street, and the officer will say to them, well, can't you just tell me when you see them dealing drugs and I'll come and arrest them? When the goal of the citizen is to get rid of the drug market, they don't really care if the person gets arrested or not. So you end up with this complicated set of circumstances where there's a series of needs within a community, the community attempts to address them with the police officer or the department, sometimes that department is not well situated to do that. You're not in the business of um, teaching people black and white photography, that's really a community response. So you end up fulfilling multiple roles sometimes that can be complicated. So how we measure the, that, that interaction with citizens and the police becomes both very important and very complicated. Right, and I think historically arrests have always been one way that officers have been assessed. Right, not unreasonable, that's part of the goal. So how then do you change this in the new world where we're trying to assess them on soft skills? You know, it would be difficult for me to discuss the, uh, the method the department's gonna use going right. forward uh, right. to evaluate. It's far above my pay grade right. as a lieutenant <laughs> in the NYPD. Uh, what I can tell you is what I know uh, in 23 years uh, of policing. And, uh, you know, it's for the department, the, the upper echelon of the department, to come up with methods uh, and the technology to evaluate police officers in, in the way that, uh, you know, that the public deserves. Uh, but it would be, uh, you know, I couldn't say to you what they're going to do going forward because, frankly, the police commissioner has never called me to uh, tell me Neither. how he wants to, <laughs> to, to do things. So, I, I mean, I'm sure. It will come out. The department is very transparent now. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there'll be different uh, methods uh, that will come forward uh, as time comes on. One, one thing that is an absolute uh, guarantee to get the word out, comps that still exists. As we said, they're, they're shifting some of the measurements there. And now this is being a measurement. 
So there's still obviously, I mean, you can't ignore numbers. The number of murders is still going to be out there. But they're, they're introducing these community. How many fake split sets you're increasing getting at? How many interactions you're having? So this is becoming part of the ComStat um, dialogue. So once that gets out, <coughs> the precinct commanders, it's an absolute priority to them. And then that get, gets kicked down to the officers. So it's, we're still trying to come up with the measurements, but the fact that it is a priority of management is becoming clearer and clearer every day. Because once you put in ComStat, it's mandated. Hi, over here, uh, Alex Vitale from Brooklyn College. Uh, Danny, I had a question for you. Have you had conversations with young people about these large-scale gang raids that have happened in the Bronx and some other communities? Are you hearing anything from them? And also, as part of that, are you having conversations with them about how they use social media and what the implications of that might be? Yeah, um, I have not had a conversation about some of the gang pieces, uh, some of these raids that are happening. Um, we've seen some of them. I know they directly impact some of our young people. Personally, I have not had a conversation, um, but I would like to find out, yeah. You know, I know that's something that happens actually in the time that I've been working in Hunts Point now. We've seen maybe at least two major drug raids um, right on Hunts Point Ave um, in, in our community. And, and obviously a lot of young men, um, we know, got arrested around that. Uh, because drugs and violence is obviously still a big part of the, the culture in that community. Um, but I have not had those conversations. Um, around social media, we actually do a lot of work around that as well. That is an area that, again, we find that uh, a lot of the problems that young people are catching, that a lot of the, the, the beefs that are being born, again, are being born on Instagram, on Facebook, um, you know, on Twitter, <laughs> and 140 characters. Um, you know, and so we actually, uh, you know, again, in response to some of these things, you know, um, in the summer, we, in our summer camp, um, we actually implement, uh, the young people do a Tumblr account, and so we're actually getting them um, to talk a little bit about their use of social media and getting them to see the impact of social media and how, again, to use it positively, um, to actually build themselves up as opposed to tear themselves down. Um, we talk about things like what happens when you go to a job interview and your boss is looking at your Facebook account or your future potential employer is looking at your Facebook account or you want to go to, uh, let's say, higher education. You know, the first thing people are looking at now, again, is that alternative world, your real world. Um, and so we do a lot of work around that. We try to train the young people again to think about the impact of their use of social media, not only how much time they're on it, um, but what are they doing on it. And if there's opportunities for them to contribute to social media, um, how do they do it again in a way that's safe, that's positive, um, that tells a story potentially, but that doesn't necessarily uh, create opportunities for violence. So we, we do talk a lot about that, yeah. I like the young man part. Uh, I'm Bob Lilly of the Rise Black Foundation. Um, I'm happy to say that we gave for a small foundation a substantial amount of money to the beginning of the real-time crime center. Uh, and we, we work with Crime Stoppers now. But, uh, Lieutenant, I wanted to ask more about the, uh, the gun stoppers uh, in terms of you, you mentioned ab about how much money has been spent so far in that project. Uh, just how, how, how big is it, if you could expand a little bit more, is it now? And what are you thinking about how it could expand with more support? It sounds stoppers. like a wonderful way of, uh, of addressing a neighborhood problem. It's, it's a great program, Gun Stoppers. It's, it's enabled us to get a lot of guns off the street. But, uh, you know, listen, with anything in society, the best way to, uh, to make it better is probably through the media. You know, let people know that it exists. People aren't 100% and, and uh, aware of the program. Uh, they're not aware that they can collect $1,000 for, you know, turning over the guy they don't even like for carrying a gun. Uh, you know, you, you see a gun in the street and, and, and you don't want to call 911, but you want to call gun stoppers, you know, and give a description. They'll, they'll get it out and, and you can get rid of the gun. So to answer your question, I, I think the best way to expand the program is probably to educate the public on exactly what the program entails. Uh, that, hey, you know, A, we want to get the guns off the street to prevent violence, but B, the department's willing to pay you uh, through the foundation uh, for the guns that you give us. Uh, it may not be the most moral or honorable way to do it, but it works. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's honorable or moral. We'll do what we got to do to get guns off the street. No, they're not. They're not. Thank you. Uh, I'm a chief with the New York City Police Department. Uh, I come on in 1979, so it's 38 years, and I'm alumni of John Jay College. Very proud of that. Uh, Professor, we're looking for solutions, and I think that's the reason I, I come up here. 
because I'm always looking for knowledge. But the mentality has to be out there that uh, the philosophy of snitches get stitches and wind up in ditches uh, has to go away. The New York City Police Department is trying to embrace the community. And back to civilian complaints, last year we brought civilian complaints down and still reduced crime. So we're going in the right direction. But we have to build a trust in the community where they're gonna tell us where the gun is. Because I've gone to hundreds of shootings and homicides where oh, I, I knew the kid on the sixth floor was a bad kid. You know, I knew he had a gun. Well, you didn't tell us. Now, the damage is done. Or they see one of their neighbors, he never worked a day in his life, and he's got cash in his pocket, and he's driving around in a, a Lexus, and everybody knows, but they don't want to tell us. So there's only so much NYPD can do, and our partners in law enforcement, but it's the people that have a vested interest in their community. I'm a Brooklyn resident my whole life. I know what it was like to take the train up here. I worked in the 73 in the early 80s. I know what you went through, Professor. That, and we still get the, uh, the uh, calls to 911, uh, and it's anonymous. They don't want to tell us anything. It's vague information. And a shot spotter will get them going off. We know there's shots being fired, numerous shots, and not one 911 call came into NYPD. So it's their neighborhood. It's their children. So I think part of the solution is it's nice to go up to areas and demonstrate and hold signs, but I wonder how many kids know who's dealing drugs or has a gun to call somebody about it. You know, everybody wants crime to be down. That's all, we have children involved in this, but we have to pick up the phone or we have to go to the NCO officer who you developed a relationship and said, I really don't want to get involved, but Johnny Jones is dealing crack or he's got a gun and I'm stepping away, but now the, the police officer, it's on him now to do it. He can't say, well, tell me when he's doing it. We build a case. We can get search warrants. And also, the, my last point is, how many times we arrest people with guns, and it's heartbreaking. They get out through technicalities, or there's a, a particular judge that, in this case, this guy had the gun. He dropped it, it's not in his hands. He beat the case, and le later on he goes and shoots somebody, but nah, we didn't see him with the gun, so I think we all have to look at who our uh, legislators are and who our judges are and uh, you know, just take hold of what happens. Thank you very much. So just uh, to kind of uh, put that in, in a, a more of a question form, um, I think for both Danny and, and, uh, and Greg and Mark, um, how do you see these new relationships developing a different uh, approach to criminal activity? Is, is that one of the intended effects? And do you see, Danny, that as a potential effect of a better relationship with the police? Better reporting, uh, better targeting of arrests, better targeting of enforcement activity? That's a good question. Again, I um, I don't know. Again, I think it's too early to to talk about how the impact of the community, uh, the of the neighborhood policing is gonna is gonna have on our community. Um, we do find that, again, depending on the situation um, and who you're talking to. For example, in Hunts Point, there's a there's homeowners right on Manita Street. These are million dollar homes. Um, this is not NYCHA housing. This is not a uh, you know um, how do you say like a. Uh, uh, um, you know, shelter, the shelter system. These are homeowners, right? These are people that have um, a stake in the community in a different way. When they call the police, it's obviously a different response, you know? Um, so they have a different stake in how the community and why they want the community to be safe. Um, you know, one of the things that we always question is, again, how did these young people get these guns? Um, where are these guns coming from? Um, I think that's a national issue. I think that, um, you know, in our community, you know, we, we do see, again, I see parents coming in there that maybe on a questionable day, you know, you might have to think about them twice, even in your own community, but they're the parent of this child that's coming into my program. So again, for us, it's always about the individual walking in. I've never had, you know, considering how many gangs there might be in the neighborhood, considering how much violence, we've never had serious violence in our space. 
Young people come in, they respect the space. Adults come in, they respect the space. What they're doing outside in the community may not be, may be questionable, but again, they're walking in, respect to our space because they know what we're trying to do in the community. So we see a lot of different people um, in a lot of different ways. Again, I don't know, you know, um, yeah, I don't know what it means to have to tell, ask somebody, you know what, um, do you have a gun or, um, you know, what are you going to do with that gun? Or, you know, honestly, these are not things that we, we talk about because these are not things that directly impact the work. We are way more interested in, again, what are the alternatives and how do I get this young person who might have a gun at home or even in their pocket, how do I get them to do something different for X amount of hours so they can stay out of trouble? And that's a little more, it's, a little, it's obviously a lot different than, than, than policing, but that's, that's the type of conversations that we have because we have a very short window of time in engaging with young people. And again, they're spending most of the day in school or at home. They come to us for maybe three, five, 10 hours a week. There's only so much impact we could have there. Again, if we can get them involved with things that are gonna change their perception about themselves, then maybe they won't be doing these crimes. You know, If they know that they can build up a skill that allows them to get off the streets and not sell drugs, then that's where we wanna enter into the conversation with them. So again, it's very tricky. Um, and again, we've seen young people that we've been in our program you know, there's a young man, for example, that recently got arrested again. You know, he shot somebody who was 14 years old. He came back into the community. Um, originally, you know, he was trying to keep himself, um, uh, you know, uh, off, off the streets and off of trouble. But again, he came back on his own. You know, he was 14, 15 years old. He probably did a one or two years. He came out when he was like 16, 17 years old. He came back to a community, again, still has no family. He left the community without family. He comes back into this community. He has no, sa no safety network, no support system. He was back on the streets. From what I'm hearing um, in the last couple of months, he's actually back in jail. And now he's not a juvenile anymore. Now he's going in as an adult. So it's a whole different series of, of, of issues that he's going to have to deal with. But we see a lot of that. Where are the support systems um, and how do we serve as that? You know, uh, I have two children of my own. But uh, de facto, I, I, you know, I mentor, I, I serve as a father figure for several dozen young people in my life, right, and in the space. Um, but I can only do so much, you know. So there's a lot of these other periphery issues that we deal with, that we have to talk about, that we engage in. Again, that's not just around gun violence, but again, that does address gun violence and just violence in general. But we have to really look at where these young people are, and, and that's where a lot of our energy is spent, honestly, is where, do we, where are these young people, and how do we keep them, again, going safely and successfully along the way? So it is, it's very tricky, but again, I don't, I don't, we don't directly talk like that, you know, per, per se. Briggs, you had a question. Uh, my question piggybacks off Danny Peralta's reference to the 2009 murder of a member of his organization, which was a homicide by knife. And as a historian, when I look at the ratio of homicides by gun and homicide by knife, it really hasn't changed in 30 years. And that means that whatever drove down the homicide rate in New York City wasn't fewer guns on the street. It wasn't the 400 guns a year that we collected by stop and frisk. And it also means, in regards to Professor Curtis's comment, that whatever is driving the problem isn't probably just guns. And that the focus on gun violence, on guns, and yes, there are about 1,300 uh, shootings a year in New York City now, isn't it actually the cause? There's something else going on, because if it were fewer homicides by gun, we would see that ratio changing over the past 30 years, and it's not. So I guess uh, the question here is a reduction in overall violence, a reduction in overall homicides. Um, there's, a different, there's potentially a different mechanism here, and um, do we, I think the question is, is for uh, Officer Moreno, do you see a, a, uh, something specific to guns in the uh, work that you're doing right now to reduce violence, or is it more general? I mean, the department now has developed the precision policing plan, uh, where they try to target uh, the persons that they believe are committing violent crimes, uh, gang members, uh, people with historically uh, bad records, if you will. So, that's the department's uh, methodology right now in attempting to reduce gun violence. You know, who, who are the people who have used guns previously in the community? Who are our known gang members who associate with people uh, who use guns? Those are the people who are going to use guns in the future. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the method that we're going with now to try to reduce gun violence going forward. I think we have time for about one more question. Uh, 
Uh, Ronaldo Colon, I'm with CBS News. Quick question. Is there a connection between the studies that you're doing and where these guns are coming from? The study with the, the survey? The surveys that you're doing, the surveys that you guys are doing and collecting, not, not is it specific. telling you where these guns are coming from? This into the professor's neighborhood. This survey is not measuring that. I'm sure the department is, is doing other research. I've been reading Virginia seems to be where a lot of it. What? Do they share it with you, the other we, states? Well, I've been reading about I think some of the laws that are coming up now, I've, I've seen the commissioner being concerned about the fact that they're getting more lenient because we do see a lot of it coming from the south and those laws down there being more lenient. The study we're doing now is measuring something different, but I. I've seen other information coming out of the department that's determined where it comes from. I mean, historically, guns have come from the South, where they're easier to purchase. You buy a gun in a pawn shop down the South. So they're not coming from New York. You're not buying a gun in a pawn shop in New York. You're buying it in a, uh, you know, in a gun shop. It's not legal gun owners who are shooting people in the streets. It's people with illegal handguns. So uh, to answer your question, guns, where are they coming from? They're coming from the South. Let me add that my, my interest here is not so much where they come from, because I totally agree that we pretty much know where they come from. They're able to trace them back to the gun shops where they were bought or stolen very often. But what I'm interested in, in my neighborhood, is what accessibility does the regular uh, young person in the neighborhood have to those guns? Is it widespread accessibility, or is it a very narrow group of people who have access to those guns? That's a question that I don't really know the answer to, but it's one that we're asking in my class. Um, one question that we ask on our survey is, if you wanted to get it, can you get a gun? And if you can, how fast can you get it? Minutes, hours, days, weeks, or I don't know. And we've got some pretty interesting results on that uh, that vary, as you might imagine, uh, the 19th precinct doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, accessibility, but the, but the 7 one and the, <coughs> You know, seven three and the seven five, yeah. So no surprise there. But that, those are the kind of things that I want to look at over time. Does accessibility to guns uh, increase or decrease? I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'd like to know. So uh, we are about to wrap up, and I'll hand over to Rick in just a moment. But just to uh, Mr. Colon's question, um, the. New York State Attorney General's office, uh, um, Schneiderman, Eric Schneiderman's office, just put out a major report on uh, the guns used in crimes in the last, I think it's about a 10 year data set. And they've traced every single gun. Uh, they know where they came from. They know how long, the, uh, how much time has passed between purchase and use. They know how many times it's been used. It's a great data set, it's transparent, it's online. I suggest if anybody's interested in it that you take a look. Uh, but Rick, if you wanna kind of wrap up for us here, we will take a 15 minute break after Rick's done. Okay, well, hopefully I don't fall off the stage and kill myself here. Um, well, ladies and gents, I'm hoping that you're gonna stay here for the afternoon session. Um, I don't really have much to add to what the gentlemen here have had to say. I'm very pleased that you've shown up, that I've learned a lot about what you've had to say, and I hope the audience has learned something too, and hope to see you at after lunch then. This morning's panel, as we know, focused on uh, law enforcement and some of the perspectives and solutions from law enforcement on the gun violence issue in New York City. Uh, to for the second panel, we are going to talk about gun violence solutions from the public health realm. And uh, this is a, uh, a complementary set of solutions that, again, the city itself is investing very heavily in, uh, has been for some years, and is, is doing even more so. Um, and we're going to hear about that from some of our panelists here. Um, please, take the stage, Shayla. Sorry. So introductions are in order. I want to introduce from uh, from left, from my left. Sorry, your right to uh, from right to left. Uh, all the way on my left, we have Eric Cumberbatch, uh, who is a New York City native, born and raised. Eric is the executive director of the NYC Mayor's Office for uh, to prevent gun violence. 
uh, an office that serves to coordinate and amplify the city's anti-gun violence initiatives across government, communities, and justice partners. Next to Eric, we have Ife Charles. Ife is the citywide coordinator of anti-violence programs at the Center for Court Innovation, where she's responsible for staffing, managing, and delivering technical assistance to the center's violence prevention initiatives. Next to Ife, we have Jeff Coots, our very own Jeff Coots, I should say, who serves as the director of the From Punishment to Public Health initiative that's based here at John Jay College. Uh, Punishment to Public Health is a consortium of academic, policy, and direct service organizations joined together to design and expand systemic preventive interventions that reduce incarceration and enhance public health and public safety in New York City. And last but certainly not least, our moderator for this panel is Shayla Delgado. Shayla is a senior research analyst and project director at John Jay College's Research and Evaluation Center where she leads the center's evaluation of cure violence in New York. So let's give our panelists a hand. So just a quick reminder, we will give each panelist about 10 minutes to talk about their own work, and then our uh, moderator will lead a few minutes of conversation, after which we will turn it out to the audience for Q&A. Thanks. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I've been looking forward to moderating this panel for since, since I found out. Um, I am very ex excited to be here on stage with this very distinguished guest. Um, so I want to start off by saying, just setting the stage um, about what has happened in New York City over the past 11 years. So despite what we hear from Washington, uh, or from some people from Washington, um, New York City is safer today than it was even just in 2006. Um, by two sources of data, from the New York State Hospital and from the New York City Police Department, um, crime has declined over the past 11 years by about 35%, um, which is a really good thing. So those are, that's the good news. The bad news is that some neighborhoods in New York City are still experiencing, um, are still plagued with gun violence specifically. And so um, we are here today to learn what the city is doing, other than um, conventional law enforcement strategies, um, to bring down the level of gun violence. Um, so I am going to start with Jeff. He is going to um, let us know what this public health approach to gun violence is, um, which I'm going to just start saying that um, it focuses on prevention rather than um, the criminal justice system's way of usually reacting to certain things. Um, so here we go. Thank you, Shayla. And uh, let me start by apologizing. I'm a bit under the weather, uh, but rested up yesterday so that I could be here with you all today. Um, thank you to the Reisenbach Foundation and, and to Dan for organizing this and, and for everybody else to come to, to talk about this issue, which is a challenging one. Um, despite the successes in driving down crime overall and, and violent crime in particular, we still see that there are some communities that are plagued by gun violence. And um, I'll try to set out a bit of how the public health community views this. Uh, in my work, often I find myself either in a room of, of mostly law enforcement or police-oriented people, and I speak about public health stuff, or I'm in a room of mostly medical folks and uh, public health practitioners, and I talk about law enforcement stuff. So. A lot of what I do is try to provide a, a basic overview and, and then uh, set the stage for people who are more qualified than I to, to talk about the details. And so that, I play that role again today and look forward to hearing your comments. I think any discussion of violence um, in New York or anywhere in this country has to start with a conversation about the history of violence in the country, one that was founded on genocide and, and slavery and the historic um, pillars that, that come through to today, right? Um, violence against the native peoples and, and the others that we have defined by race, creed, gender, and sexuality. And, and I think another aspect of that is the glorification of violence at the individual level when it's used for good, right? And that may be protecting your personal freedom uh, as, as captured in the Second Amendment. Uh, the Wild West, our uh, tendency to, to heroize members of the military, 
and uh, often when people take actions to protect women and children, that we see a utility in the use of force and uh, at times uh, aggrandize that. A and we see force as a problem-solving agent. And when it comes to, to law enforcement, we talk a lot about general versus specific deterrence, right? The general deterrent being the legislation that we passed, the tone that we set. Um, and then um, specific deterrence w when we try to intercept the cycle of violence, interrupt the cycle of violence. And that often plays out through the use of uh, uh, police enforcement. And we grant the police department a legitimate use of force, right? We say that this entity is uh, part of our government structure that we say is allowed to use force for the, for the uh, benefit of the community at large. And uh, in many ways, this is very useful and things that we like. I'll take the example of uh, groping on the subways, something that's been in the news recently, right? When an individual is doing that, generally a male uh, perpetrating against a female, we are very pleased when a police officer inter intervenes and forcefully, if necessary, removes that individual from the subway system, right? So it serves a purpose in our community, um, but it is still force, and we have to recognize it as such. Um, and I think when we, when we look at the use of force as a specific deterrent, and we see the benefits of, of what law enforcement can do with that specific deterrent, that much as um, my colleague uh, Rick Curtis said, there are other members of the community, there are other institutions in the community that need to come and fill the gaps that are left after police uh, use that. And where public health and I think the health community writ large fails is by ceding issues of violence to law enforcement. We all need to address violence in our own way and with our own expertise. And when we leave the issue of violence to law enforcement alone, we are, we are going to end up with the challenges that we see with over-policing, um, with communities feeling like they are being blamed for the violence that exists in their own community. And we, we are confronted with this dichotomy of good, good uh, person versus bad person and who's culpable and who, who's able to be um, redeemed. From the, the global uh, health perspective and even nationally where the Centers for Disease Control looks at violence uh, writ large, they, they have developed kind of a four-part approach to this and CDC borrows it from global health. Number one is to define and monitor the problem and I would say when they look at violence, uh, when they define the problem, Seldom is gun violence the one that they want to focus on. More often it's domestic violence that health practitioners and public health uh, focus will land. And I would also point out that law enforcement, as we were just discussing, is, the, is leading the way in monitoring the use of gun violence uh, and that the way that the health system does it is more of a passive way by monitoring who comes into the emergency room or seeks help in relation to, to gun use. And then the second main strategy, and this is across public health, this is a way to pursue prevention, is to identify the risk and the protective factors. Right, so there are risk factors that are internal and external that make you more, more prone to violence, more prone to use a gun. And then the protective factors are those things that when somebody has those risk factors, how do we identify the things that protect those people uh, and, and sort of buffer against that risk? And then you develop and test prevention strategies, something that I heard come up earlier. We wanna focus on what are the strategies to intervene and to prevent. And then the fourth, something that's more uh, kind of clinical in nature but, but can be expanded, is to assure the widespread adoption of these strategies that work. And that's one of the things that, that Shayla and her group have worked on and, and I'm sure um, my fellow panelists will, will touch on. And so from a public health perspective and in clinical health and in health education, um, and I think as with the general culture, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we've ceded this issue of violence to law enforcement. And I think that is to our detriment. My wife's an occupational therapist, and we were, she was driving me to the train this morning and lamenting how as she's hiring new, uh, new clinicians to work with her uh, as they try to grow their, their clinic to serve the adolescents that are aging out of autism uh, services in elementary schools, that most of the people that are applying for these jobs to work with adolescents have some type of law enforcement background. 
And I said, that wasn't surprising to me because they have developed through their education, through their practice, a certain comfort with violence. And these adolescent um, kids who are on the autism spectrum will lash out because they can't communicate the way they want to. And so when they're toddlers and they do it, you can take the, the bite or the hit in the chest or you know, some, sometimes being st struck in the face. But when it's a 15-year-old and he weighs more than you do, it's, it's a serious challenge to employment there. And so one of the things that I, that I want to encourage us to think about, and I think that we have more law enforcement inclined people here, but I say the same thing when I'm with my, my health and public health folks is, we need to generalize our comfort with violence and, and kind of fine tune our own clinical and, and uh, data capacities to understand violence and develop responses to violence that aren't just around law enforcement, but could be around access to mental health services. I proposed this in a, in a recent conference of, you're gonna tell me when I'm, when I'm running over time, right? Okay. Um, I, I was at a public health conference and it was actually a, a school in the city here and they were trying to kind of lead the way in addressing mass incarceration from a public health perspective. And I raised this issue that we as clinicians, as practitioners are gonna have to become more comfortable with violence. They looked at me like I had just proposed jumping off a cliff. They had no interest in serving people who were involved with violence. And often we hear this from the clinicians that we try to get to work with people who have histories of criminal justice involvement. They'll say, those aren't our clients. We don't serve those types of clients. And that is a, that is a challenge from the health community. From a, from a population health perspective, which, which public health uses, we end up with kind of a, I'm gonna mispronounce this word, a matryoshka effect, the Russian doll effect when we look at violence and when we look at gun violence in particular, right? We, sir, we keep track of personal injury, we keep track of use of force, intentional injuries, then we keep, uh, and that would be violence, and then we keep track of gun violence. So for somebody from a public health perspective to really specialize their focus on gun violence is quite rare. Um, for somebody in public health to focus on mass incarceration or something like that is quite rare. That's how I have the job that I do. Uh, when I was in public health school, I would, everybody gives PowerPoints. So my PowerPoint would go after the one about schistomyosis and before the one about childhood obesity. And I would stand up and say, here's how, why we, our community needs to care about prisons and jails and the impacts that they have on, on individuals and communities. Um, and I think the, uh, the challenge that we have in, in understanding the magnitude of the problem and the specificity of, of the challenges that individuals involved in violence face um, is laid bare, so this morning in prepping, I admit I tried yesterday, but I wasn't able to, to look at my computer screen for more than five minutes. Um, I, I did a search on uh, the city Department of Health website, and I typed in violence. The first 10 things that popped were about domestic violence, as I mentioned earlier. I go to the second page, and then number 15 was about childhood violence, and so I thought I had it there, but that was really about zero to 12. <coughs> And when I added gun violence to my search, there were only three things that came up. And one was a report from, <coughs> excuse me, from 2013 on gun violence in the city. And so I think we need to talk more about gun violence. We need to talk more about violence in general. <coughs> and I have three calls to action, but I'm gonna wait until my colleagues here get through their pieces and I'll try to do it in the Q&A. So while everybody's um, getting better here. Um, so Ife has, um, she planned and directed the first cure violence program here in New York City, um, actually in the state of New York. And she also served on the um, New York City Task Force to Combat Gun Violence back in 2012 that centered the issue of gun violence as an epidemic in New York City. Um, so she can, if she can tell us about um, the task force, that, that's when the whole creation of the crisis management system started, and she'll tell us about that, and then we'll hear, hear from Eric about what the Office of Gun Violence Prevention, and, or the Mayor's Office of Gun Violence Prevention is doing to address all of these issues from a different lens. So like Jeff, I am battling an upper respiratory infection and have been under the weather for a little bit. 
and getting married on Friday, people. And, <laughs> and so I am drained, and all my mother can think about is, are you going to be able to have a drink at your wedding, right? Um, after antibiotics, but <coughs> shouldn't stop me, right? Um, but I really just want to say thank you guys. Um, thanks, Jeff and John Jay and Shayla to have me on the panel, sitting with Eric and Jeff. Um, a little history about Sharon E. Faye Charles. I am a child, grew up in Brooklyn. Brooklyn has been home for me for quite some time. Um, unlike some of my friends, I think I had a little pretty cushioned life, even though domestic violence was a part of my existence. My father was an alcoholic um, and at times very abusive, um, verbally abusive and physically abusive to the furniture and things in the house, right? Um, stuck my mother up a couple of times on the train to get her off with a knife, broke into the house, chained himself to the to the house. Um, I tell you all of this because violence has been a part of my existence. Um, he got stabbed um, on Easter Sunday morning when I was 15 years old and came into the vestibule of our house and my Easter dress as a good old Catholic girl at that time um, was all splattered with blood and I had to clean my father's blood off of the floor and off of my dress. So violence has been a part of me. I've had friends who have been shot and have been killed. Um, some in front of my face, others by phone calls that you hear about the violence. So violence is part of who I am. It is not who I am in existence with the work that I'm doing, but it drives everything that we do. <coughs> and so when we talk about the violence, and I'm glad that Jeff mentioned, we have to talk about the history of violence. Um, this is what this nation was built upon. And do we talk about the indigenous people, the other folks are me, the brown skinned black woman out here that have to deal with the violence that society brings towards us. And so I work for the Center for Court Innovation. Um, and, and someone said to me, you come from an accounting background. That was when I first came out of school. That's what, what I was doing. I was in banking. But it never really fulfilled who I was as a person because I knew that I had to do something about the violence that I lived with, I grew up with and continue to see. And so opportunities came about for me to do this work because I was always doing it. Because one of the things that we've come to realize is that they, all of these labels, crisis management system, the cure violence, the credible messengers, those definition existed prior to a term being assigned to their work. And so the cure violence model after coming out of Chicago, and some people say, well, why in the heaven God nations would you guys want to do a model that shows, is showing currently that it's not fulfilling the needs of quieting the violence in Chicago? But Amy Ellen Bogan and myself out in Crown Heights through the Center for Court Innovation for years been doing violence prevention work. We've been doing it through the art of mediation. So we ran conflict mediation workshops. We brought groups together. We worked in schools to help young people think about other ways to solve violence. However, it still continued to exist in our communities, in Crown Heights. I don't know if you guys are from Brooklyn. So I grew up in Brooklyn on Park Place between Washington and Underhill back in the 70s and 80s. Two blocks away from my house was a known group of gang involved individuals, but they were also my friends. Do I turn my back on my people or do I continue to work with them and to, to think about how their lives are going to change later on? And so part of this, and I'm saying all of this back history because it's what propelled me to do this work and to think about how do we bring this public health approach to community who don't think that it is an epidemic. It's normal when you sit in your house and you hear gunshots, right? Because the routine for us was that as soon as you heard the gunshots, you knew it wasn't firecrackers, you hit the floor. And then for some of us, we get up and we feel ourselves and we see if we were the ones that were shot. That was our existence. That is what we live in. That is who we are. And so when the opportunity came about to do the work around gun violence prevention, Honestly, I wasn't really about doing that work at that particular time in the format that Chicago had it. I guess I was rebellious about it because to me, it didn't make sense, right? It didn't make sense that this was gonna be aligned to an epidemic. It, was, it didn't make sense that it was gonna be used as a public approach to reduce gun violence because we didn't think of it as such. 
we just thought it was normal for us to be shot and killed or to kill each other as people of color. The conversation about doing work around prevention and, and how do we look at people who've been there and done that to go back into those same streets of violence to then make change was a concept that I could not readily receive. As I said before, that's not the way that brown and black folks was doing this work, right? And I think sometimes we don't, we, you know, we get very antsy when we start talking about race and violence. If I was to ask how many of you in this room right now, how many in this room right now have experienced gun violence where your child or a sibling has been taken down by a gun? Would you raise your hands? All right. If I change the format of this room, there's gonna be a bunch of kids that's between the ages of 14 to 21 that can tell you they've lost a sibling, a father, a brother, a sister to gun violence. So we can't sit, and I think Eric and they know me well, and Shayla know me well, when it comes to talk about violence, for me as a woman of color, and people normally say, well, what happened about the, the children who were killed um, in, in Connecticut? And I often say, I, my heart grieve. I've lost a son. My son died at six. He didn't die from violence. He died from an illness, and as a mother, I thank God every single day that my son was taken away from me from an illness. And some might say, why would you say that? Because there's more consolation in my spirit that he died from an illness than somebody knocking on my door saying he was gunned down, which is what a lot of brown and black moms face every single day or fathers face every day. So when we started doing this work, a dear friend of mine's son was killed right around the corner from my house where she heard the gunshots and her son was dead as she walked out the house. Her name is Robin Lyle. Robin came into the office and she said, we gotta do something about gun violence. And I said, Robin, we are trying our best to do work around gun violence. She's like, no, we really have to do something about this. And so many years back, we applied for all of these grants to do violence prevention work, and it wasn't the in thing at that particular time. Because you know, when there's in thing, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon to do the stuff. And so, our people, brown and blacks, are usually those guinea pigs and test projects around the end thing to see if it works. And sometimes that's painful, but sometimes it's needed. And so we were awarded some stimulus money to do the cure violence model. And we started doing the cure violence model in the 7-7 precinct. The 7-7 precinct where I grew up, the 7-7 precinct where I met my first love, um, people say to me, you do this work, and, and my, my new love is also law enforcement. So it's like a battle when we have conversations. The rule is don't talk about your work, I don't talk about mine. But they bland, right? And so we started doing this work and started realizing that in order for us to make change, we had to change everyone in the community. Folks had to believe, not just it didn't because it didn't hit you, that it had an impact on you. Because what Eric and I just experienced a couple weeks ago when a young woman was killed in the Bronx, shot in the head, our people didn't get to see the impact. And this is part of this whole crisis management system, and I'm rambling on because there's so many pieces to this before we got to where cure violence is, right? Being on the task force and, and talking about the issues about not just doing violence prevention, but doing support work. Because you can't tell somebody to put a gun down and not have nothing else for them to do. You can't tell someone that what you're experiencing is trauma when they don't even know what trauma is. Black and brown folks don't do therapy well. We don't wanna talk about it. We don't wanna experience it. It is not healing for us. And so part of this work as we talk about the cure violence was that we started to, to look at our people in our communities because this was happening in the 7-7, the 7-9, the 4-0, the 4-2, the, the, the 113 precinct, predominantly black communities and brown communities. It wasn't happening in the first precinct, right? It was happening where there was poverty. So when Jeff talked about that, and we talk about the history of the violence that we're dealing with, we're talking about poverty, poverty-stricken areas 
where there's no resources for individuals. And if folks talk immediately and say, oh, well, kids need to be in school. Sometimes a school is more violent than it is on a street. That's real for us. Folks immediately want to say, well, let's put kids into jail. Let's lock them up. The whole thing with the MS-13 and, and making this a gang, you know, <laughs> talking about putting kids for 20 years. How many of you guys have been actually been in a prison? Okay. When those gates and those doors close behind you, is reform actually happening? So when we talk about violence, we have to talk about all those aspects. Some of it is not nice for us to talk about because it makes us uncomfortable. But the work that we're doing is uncomfortable to a lot of our communities. And so what we started to do is to start to engage communities about changing their practices, about changing their norm. It wasn't normal to hear gunshots 24 hours, seven days a week. That is not normal. It is not normal. How do you change somebody's thought to think that it's normal. It's not normal. And that's a challenge. That's part of the stuff that we're doing with Cure Violence. And so as I pass this mic on to, to Eric, the work that we're doing in communities and we've been doing and the challenges that we've had is trying to change folks who have been embedded in the violence for such a long period of time that coming out of violence is not easily received because it's not their normal. When we get up in the morning, my normal routine is to go wash my face, brush my teeth, meditation, say my prayers, and then get on the train. For some kids, that doesn't happen. For some communities, they don't even have water. And yes, we live in New York City, but some places don't have running water. But those are the stories that we don't hear when we talk about violence prevention and we link it to the whole health approach model. I don't mean to downhearten anyone, but it's the existence that we live in, I live in. I see daily when a mother cannot bury her child and we, a city, have to come together to bury that individual, that is not normal. When I encourage parents to, tell their ch to get life insurance on their children, that is not normal. When you choose to cremate because it's not your practice, but because it's the cheapest way to bury your child, that is not normal. And so when we talk about violence, and we talk about it in that sense, and we talk about cure violence, and we talk about the work and the task force, we're talking about a city coming together, and Jeff said it best. There's got to be a collaborative. I do believe that incarceration is needed for some. Right? It is. But reform has to happen there also. It should never be police against community. We should be working as a collaborative. We should be working together to bring change. And so often we hear that the cure violence world don't want to work with the police or that the police are bad. I'd be a liar. Like I said, I was involved with a police officer before, right? There was love there before. There is love there always. It is part of the existence of our world. We can coexist. Law enforcement, I work for the Center for Court Innovation. We're, we're a reformative justice project, right? Testing approaches, doing technical assistance, implementing new projects to see if they work, and then to be able to bring them out to different communities. At the end of the day, if we're going to make change and if cure violence is going to work, and if all of these new initiatives around prevention, we have to work together. I am an advocate for working for NY, with NYPD. I am an advocate for working with the health department. I am an advocate for people coming together and working for the better of our young people and our communities. So now we're gonna hear from Eric. Thank you, Shayla. And, and can I just say something before? So we actually have to leave this room by 1245 um, because they're going to set up for lunch. So um, I will, I assume you guys have a lot of questions. So I am going to go into questions at about 1230 to 1235. Um, 
Go ahead. Thank you. It, first, I just want to try and add some levity and humor to the room. I, I don't think I'll make it off of this stage without being sick. Uh, <laughs> that will be a miracle with everyone coughing and sharing the same water. It's a, So it's just interesting. Um, thank you for having me uh, join you all today. And I'm, I'm really honored and grateful just to share the space and, and share energy with you all. Um, I thought it would be ideal if I could first give you background as to how and why I'm here, uh, and then kind of go into what we uh, actually have accomplished and what we aim to continue to do across New York City. So I'll start from my childhood. Uh, born and raised here, lived across the five boroughs. Uh, I think I lived in about over 20 different places uh, before I even graduated high school. My father battled addiction. We, we traveled around place to place. Um, the first time that I, I was harmed um, physically uh, with a violent, through a violent act was by my brother. Uh, I was in elementary school and he stabbed me. Uh, he stabbed me in my back, uh, and that was a tough one, and, and I came close to actually losing my life. Uh, shortly after that, I would say around transition time from junior high school to high school was the first time that I was shot at. Uh, me and a friend were both shot at uh, six times. Uh, none of us were hit. A uh, person was up close, and it was, you know, Ife would say God and faith, and I'll say luck, <laughs> but the bullets didn't strike us. And then... I would say uh, had the opportunity to go to uh, undergrad to, on an athletic scholarship. Um, and that was the first time that I was arrested on weapons charges as well. So uh, violence and, and that culture, culture of violence uh, was almost normal. Uh, and it, it wasn't normal because there was something pressing on me, it was the, the the, the environment and culture that I was in. Um, and I was comfortable with it. And never in any of those situations did I think that this wasn't occurring or happening to other families or other people. Uh, this was just what life was and was expected to be. Um, when I was at undergrad, I had the opportunity to uh, meet a professor in Missouri um, Dr. Paula McNeil, and she brought me to Missouri and, you know, really saw a lot of great potential in me. Uh, we spoke a lot about exposure. We spoke about opportunities and, and what do I mean to a lot of uh, young people just like me. Uh, so I had the opportunity to leave, went to Missouri and found my passion uh, as a teacher. And I felt like this is the best way that I could give back to young people was to be a teacher. Uh, so I came back to New York City, Department of Education, uh, as a teacher, and I worked in one of what the Daily News called uh, schools in the dirty dozen, the 12 worst schools in the city. And I said, this is home for me. This is where I want to be, because if there's anyone who can reach these young children, it's me. Uh, so I taught junior high school in Bed-Stuy for about four years. Um, and in doing that, I realized it wasn't necessarily the content that I was delivering in the classroom. Um, but the engagement of a male role model that young people can see as their brother, their father, their best friend, whatever it may be, that made them gravitate and stay connected to me. And a lot of my students I'm still connected to in many different ways. Um, so in realizing that it wasn't just about the content, I, I wanted to be in the places that these young people were. So I, I felt like I was reaching people. The next piece was being in the places that those people uh, were coming from. And for me, it was public housing. Um, I was born in public housing, Beach, Beach 41st Street houses in, in Rockaway. Um, and I wanted to be in public housing with young kids. So I, I took on an assignment um, really uh, to work with bringing resources into public housing and working with uh, as many cultural institutions, CBOs, uh, it, it didn't matter. Uh, basically to strong arm and make sure that they were uh, directing services to public housing and opening it, their doors in unconventional ways to young people from public housing. I was very good at that. Uh, in doing that, I started to meet a lot of young people that were engaged in crews and gangs and, and started seeing a lot of young people 
um, whether it was being arrested, whether it was being shot, whether it was being victimized, different ways, um, got me into a space where I started working with groups like CCI and, and, and meeting the Ife Charles of the world and other people. Um, and like Ife pointed to, before there was funding, there was a lot of people really engaged on the ground doing whatever they can to save young people and, and to uh, present a different model and a different picture to young people um, as individuals. And that was happening across the city. And that led me to working with the Citizens Crime Commission, uh, New York Community Trust, uh, and really looking strategically, how can we identify young people that reside in specific areas and saturate those areas with services, resources, uh, every lever that we can pull from the city uh, to, to actually implement that and put it, put it into practice. So we began doing that, and uh, along that course, I met our director, Elizabeth Glazer, at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, I never looked at myself as working for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Mayor's Office of anything, um, because I never met anyone from the Mayor's Office who reflected or represented me. Uh, so I didn't see myself in that area. Uh, I actually wanted to be a pediatrician, but I never knew a pediatrician growing up, and I feel like if I did know a pediatrician, I would be working maybe right up the block at Mount Sinai or, or somewhere else. Um, but what I did know was a lot of the people and come from uh, the culture uh, or surrounded by the culture of a lot of people who are impacted adversely by violent behavior. Uh, and that's how I'm in this field. Um, I feel like I've infiltrated my way into city government uh, and as a young man uh, with humble beginnings from public housing to then uh, really work with council members, advocates, community members to build an office to prevent gun violence is a huge lift. And, and the battles and struggles that we fought to just get to that point, you know, is, is huge. Uh, and then looking at, you know, it's not just the battle of convincing people that criminal justice is beyond law enforcement partners or beyond uh, courts and, and jails, but looking at uh, crime as, as an act, and that act occurs, but then there's a tremendous amount of healing that has to occur after that act. Uh, so when we have these acts of violence, how do we heal all of those impacted? How do we heal the community? And how do we heal the individual that caused that, that action? Uh, so really changing the lens from a historical criminal justice approach, uh, more so to a people-centered focus. Um, and that really led to the launch of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence. And, and at the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, uh, we focus on three major bucket areas. I'm not model-centric by any means. You'll, you'll hear people say cure violence over and over again. I believe the best thing that cure violence has done was identify a workforce that has been severely overlooked uh, across the city and tapped into a network of individuals who have great reach and depth in communities and networks and cultures that uh, none of us will probably ever be able to reach. And they could do that not just in the realm of violence prevention, but in any field of work. Um, so in thinking with that mindset, uh, coordination was the first bucket area. So there's several initiatives across the city in terms of driving down uh, gang and gun violence, but they almost act in silos. Uh, but I believe that you know we are co-producers of public safety and we all need to be in some kind of alignment because we all share a common end goal, and that's to have healthy, safe, vibrant community. The second area is amplification, in that we can never pilot into a community, helicopter from above, and tell people what's wrong, what's right, and how we're going to fix it. That, that can't happen, it's not sustainable. Um, but what we can do is empower people in community to be the voice of change, to be part of that change, and give them the skill sets, the toolkits, uh, to be empowered to continue to create public safety in their space through their lens. 
Uh, one of the things I'm really grateful about, uh, we've been able to, and this is like exciting, cause like I'm, I'm like talking, but also like bragging, but it's like smoothly done, so you don't even realize it. <laughs> one of the things uh, that we've done, we're launching a Safe in the City grant uh, at the beginning of this coming fiscal year, where community members will be given small grants uh, to produce uh, public safety events, uh, tasks, whatever it may be in their community. But for the first time, the city actually looking at anybody that wants to do something in their community, here's the dollars to do it. Uh, and here's a toolkit of best practices from advocates across the country. And this is what they're doing in their communities. Be part of producing public safety. Uh, we've taken what began as just a, a violence interruption model with credible messengers going into the street to strategically aligning them with ACS at close to home facilities, uh, in secure detention facilities, um, in Rikers Island, uh, in the enhanced security housing unit. We're looking to build out uh, even further from there. And in a lot of schools that are in some very vulnerable neighborhoods that have a lot of challenges. So we've taken uh, these credible messengers, these, these, uh, this workforce that I speak of, and really expanded and enhanced their skill set and, and really opened other agencies to see that you can't operate in a silo and you have community as the backbone uh, for your agency operations to sustain and, and meet the goals um, that, that, that you're seeking. Ife spoke a lot about the police um, and the relationship there. But one of the first things that I've done when I came to this office was one, it's not feasible for us to operate in the city. I mean, we, there's great political will from many places, but it's politically career suicide uh, if someone champions community efforts without championing uh, law enforcement as well. So bridging that gap. And I, you know, I work in the maze, so I don't wanna go too far. This is a slippery slope as is um, in just discussing that. But, Bridging the gap between policing and community uh, on the appropriate levels. So you have these organizations, uh, you know, their credibility, their street credibility is what makes them valuable and, and able to connect with a lot of individual amongst other things. Um, but we can't coexist in a neighborhood without communication. And we can't coexist in a neighborhood uh, without helping each other attain and achieve the, the same goals. So we've been very uh, intense and direct in making sure that there is a relationship with PD. And we've had uh, several meetings with uh, DC Kasi and uh, Secre Chief Secreto and Chief Gomez and uh, even Susan Herman and other people from PD uh, with these same organizations to make sure that we are building synergy um, linking NCOs to these organizations, linking uh, commanding officers and so forth, and letting them start to begin what that dialogue looks like and ultimately building out how, how both can play a valuable role in co-producing uh, public safety. Uh, we've seen precision policing with large-scale takedowns and our office is very direct in tapping these same organizations after a takedown to go back into community with police to work on how do we help heal this fractured community. So 25, 50 people are extracted. How do we work with the families that are most impacted? How do we identify the next generation of young people that PD has their eyes on from filling the void, filling the vacancy uh, that was created? How do we put legal services to uh, a lot of these families? So really doing that piece is part of our overall amplification. And just being creative. Um, in Brownsville, for example, looking at territories and gang lines where young people literally in their heads can't go to another NYCHA development even though that development is across the street. And we've met young people who need to take the three train but instead have to walk across Eastern Parkway and come back around and get on the L train solely because they can't walk one block down. But we put these individuals together in the same room and, and them not knowing that they're from different developments that are, they believe, at war with each other. And these same young people started making music together uh, and found that they all want the same thing and they all care about the same things. 
but it's just the exposure and having the resource to, to, to really put them uh, together to see each other in a different light and to break a lot of the, the self-perceived uh, myths that they have about themselves, uh, the identity crisis that they face as how do you define me? Um, how am I defined? Uh, what does a black male, a black female, what does that even mean in society? Um, what does my future outlook have? But really breaking down those barriers. So, you know, really being creative around uh, amplification and, and getting community's voice involved. Um, yesterday, my office just released a solicitation for uh, clergy groups to be more involved and engaged um, in doing community canvassing, outreach work, uh, occupying corners, tabling, resources, all of these things in a 6 7 precinct that's leading the city in, in shooting incidents this year and has led uh, the city shooting incidents last year. Uh, the last piece I'll say is technology. I know, Shayla, is technology. Um, really being smart about what we're doing. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of great evidence-based practices, but again, I'm not particularly model-centric and, and exploring and, and letting community tell us, you know, what exists, what is out here, uh, wh what are ways we can uh, move in a different manner, a different fashion? What are the best ways of engagement? Is it being on a panel and speaking through the microphone? Is that what's going to get the public's attention? Or is it something completely the opposite that you've been seeking but no one's listening? What are the right ways to communicate? How do we message? What are those simple nudges that we can give to young people that make them think or see something in a different manner, a different light? Um, ultimately, we, we intend to create a safe, empowered, and interconnected community. I don't believe, and this is like lightning round, I don't believe that gun violence really has much to do with the gun or violence. I think it's about levels of distress and disorder in people's lives, community, and their network. Uh, it's our job as government and agencies and institutions and residents uh, to do all that we can to make sure that all of those uh, issues and items are mitigated. Uh, I believe that if we can uh, uh, help young people live healthy and, and in a healthy environment, uh, healthy environments and healthy communities don't have gun violence. Uh, so that's, that's really the, the, the pieces I think that you know, I would like to touch on. And, we're about addressing uh, all forms of violence in a holistic manner, and it, and it takes all of us. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. All right. So, um, one of, so my, the Research and Evaluation Center, um, my colleagues and I have been working over the past four years trying to um, understand the effects of the Cure Violence Model, which is the public health approach to violence reduction, or at least one of them, the, the most popular one. Um, and so um, there's one piece of tension. Um, the, some of the media covers it as having bad relationships with the police, and I think they both have talked about it. Um, but can we, Eric just said, um, we can't coexist if we don't communicate, right? We can't coexist if we don't, um, if we don't um, embrace each other's existence. But in what environment can they coexist and what experiences do you guys have implementing the model? Um, where you've actually have good stories about um, the police being um, collaborative and from both sides. Um, and we only have, just as a, we only have about seven minutes and then we're gonna go into questions. So coordination, I would say, uh, NYPD has their eyes on a lot of young people um, where they've had encounters and Beyond cure of violence, there's active people in community that can reach those individuals uh, in many different ways. And tapping into those people uh, can be beneficial. Uh, the, the street teams that are outreach workers, violence interrupters that are on the street, they also know those young people that PD has their eyes on. And if PD recognizes the street team as uh, an asset to them on the appropriate level of talking to the executive staff of that office and saying, you know, building four, five, six, this is what we're seeing every day. How can we jointly move this? Because we don't want to arrest. We actually want to see these young people pick up services and do something positive. So that's one uh, example of how a model of that piece can, or the operations of that piece can work and is working. Mm -hmm. um, and it, an, an actual example would be in East New York, 
uh, at Cypress houses where a commanding officer said, these five guys are driving all of the violence in Cyprus. Here's their name, here's their address. It's either gonna be your guys getting to them or my guys getting to them after they do something. So proactively sharing data is a uh, key and that is an actual example. For us, it goes back to that whole piece about communicating a lot of the examples that Eric just shared is some of the same things that we've experienced both in Brooklyn and in the Bronx where I, I um, supervise the Bronx teens. Um, we've had police officers sit on our hiring panel. Part of the kill violence model is to have community leaders be there when we hire those credible messengers, folks who've been there and done that, to um, bring them on. The onboarding process is to have that um, panel and hiring panel. And we've had police officers in the 4-0 oh, and the 4-2 be present at our hiring panel, which has been unheard of in the past, right? Um, but again, it goes back, Shayla, where the conversations around them saying to us, we can be out on the street, the team can be canvassing, and there will be a situation or a conflict that might be taking place. And we've educated the police officers, and they are comfortable with us, that they would say at times, if you guys are out on the streets, we're gonna let you guys handle this matter. And as Eric says, either you guys do the intervention or we will come in and do what we need to do if that doesn't get taken care of. And so I think the language that we continuously use across the communities is that this collaboration can work. We each have a role to play, right? I am not a police officer. I'm a community activist, all right? I'm a project director. I am not going to go in there and put handcuffs on a young person but I can talk a young person down from being involved in such violence. And then, if that doesn't take place, there are different steps. So I think the fact that we are now starting to, and this just started, I think, about last year, where police is respecting the workers, right? They're not labeled as just formally involved or gang-involved individuals or folks who don't have a degree. There's a level of actual human respect that is coming from NYPD right now towards the cure violence workers and the credible messengers. And that has been a change, because when we first started this about seven or eight years ago, that was not the case. It was not the case. So I think the evolution of, of us having those kind of conversations around who we are and the impact that we want. Police officers want to go home and be safe. They want to go home to their families, and so do we. We want our young peoples to go home. We don't want them to be incarcerated, and I think that mutual respect is what we're seeing across the city right now. So that's a plus for NYPD. Thank you. You can leave the mic. Oh, no, you don't want to sit for me. <laughs> so I, I have not uh, worked as much in, in New York City, and so uh, I'm speaking more to kind of the national conversation. Uh, I've had the privilege to sit in on a, a few of the meetings of the National Network for Safe Communities that runs out of, out of David Kennedy's shop here. And I think w one important piece about that, and you mentioned it, but I just want to highlight, is that the information flows one way, right? It flows from the police department to the community providers, and they're able to help them identify who may be in need or at risk in the moment. And they're very clear about the information not flowing the other way because of the concern about uh, informants and, and snitches that was raised earlier. Um, and, and I think to touch on that, I, I think part of that is a realization, or, or, or that's a manifestation from these communities that are steeped in, in violence that they don't see incarceration as a solution to this problem. And so they are less willing to involve law enforcement in the response because they see when the person goes away for maybe three years and comes back, they're not less violent when they get back or they're not you know, rehabilitated when they come back from that three years in the cage. And so part of the value of this community-based approach is it, it, like I was saying before, it puts more tools in, into the belt of the, of the practitioners. Um, and I think you know one of my calls to action that I was mentioning earlier was the need for data sharing across agencies, but also a clarity of how that data is going to be used, because there's a real issue of trust and, as you were saying, respect uh, amongst the practitioners and the community members that has to be acknowledged as we, as we seek to share data and kind of monitor what's going on in the community. Thank you, Jeff. And yeah, I think that's a that's a really important point. The data, the data part, um, making data more open. Um, collecting better information. It's something that will definitely inform us in um, making the city even safer than it is now. And now I'm going to open the floor for questions. And I think Dan is going to bring the mic around. 
Uh, Eric, you mentioned that in the wake of some of these large gang uh, raids, takedowns, that y your office is going in and trying to do some, some repair work. And one of the things I'm hearing from folks in some of those neighborhoods in the Bronx and, and upper Manhattan is that with these large conspiracy cases, the prosecutorial strategy is to try to get everyone to testify against everyone else and to use the threat of these really intensive potential sentences to do that, and that that is creating huge tensions in these communities, everyone looking over their shoulder, worried about whose kid is gonna testify against whose kid. So how are you dealing with that, and is that making your work a lot more difficult to do? So thank you. The work is always difficult. Um, what I would say is that we try to have legal aid services speak to all of the families that are involved, give them all of their options, um, dispel a lot of myths, uh, untruths that may be going on in that community by having debriefs. So the process uh, after a takedown for us is more so about creating transparency. We want everyone to know all of the facts around the case. Why did it happen? Who's involved? Uh, what they're facing, how are they being charged, and what kind of recourse is available to them. Then we try to identify all of the young people that may be impacted and how we can link them to positive resources, mentoring opportunities, employment, uh, education, whatever it may be, so that they can redirect uh, and rechannel their energy. Uh, in terms of uh, people being uh, concerned about who's telling on who for a lesser charge or, or those things, we don't really have much involvement or engagement uh, in those areas other than directing towards uh, legal services. But the rebuilding, I think, is beyond, it's beyond who is going to you know, flip on the other person. It's about your father has been, just been taken out of a household or your brother who's the breadwinner is now not there. And how do we support that family and uplift and, and continue uh, to have some type of platform for them? And I think what we're doing is, is really uh, revolutionary in that these takedowns, they may be larger in nature or more frequent, but they're not new. And I don't think there was ever a concentrated effort or a focused effort to go in and actually say, okay, let's bring the, the commanding officers, the prosecutor's office, uh, an array of services in this area and saturate that community. And I think that's, that's a, a rich piece. We want to create a springboard for young people to do positive things. And that's what we're focused on when we uh, go into those communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your stories. Um, question I had, I guess, is in reference to the other spaces that you can kind of, um, I guess, reach out to young people. And so if it's not a conversation just about violence, like what other campaigns are you able to kind of uh, talk about to, to, again, empower young people or to have them, again, look at their communities in new ways? Do you guys, um, beyond just talking about violence, do you guys also talk about things like environmental justice or do you guys enter into conversations, let's say, about, I don't know, a variety of topics, you know, leadership in other ways, you know, um, you know, gentrification, I know is also big in, in our communities right now. You know, how do, how do these campaign, how does your campaign address those other uh, issues that are happening in the community? So I know one thing for the Center for Code Innovation and the projects that we run, we have a lot of youth councils, right? Which is not focusing on the kids who are at risk or disconnected. We're looking at young people to build healthy communities. So we have leadership academies for them. There's a youth council. There's an arts piece that we do because a lot of young people are talented. We help them to think about to ways of promoting the act of nonviolence. How does that come through? So they have a speaking voice. They also run workshops. A lot of them have been employed through the year-round anti-gun violence employment initiative. So we work with a group of folks to help young people think about ways that they can bring change, right? Because normally the old heads are the ones that's always talking down to them. And so what we've come to realize with young people is that that doesn't work anymore. My generation where your mom would say, sit on the table and don't say a word, that is not the generation that we have now. Our kids are very vocal. And so we encourage them to use positive language and to address those issues such as gentrification, such as bullying, such as some of the violent issues, such about the same sex gender issues that they're dealing with. Those conversations take place because we know if they don't take place, what will happen, it can end up in a violent act, right? And so 
we encourage young people to really think about where you live and where there's value. I work in the Bronx, I live in Brooklyn. And when I first went to the Bronx, and this is why sometimes when we don't travel outside, I mean, I'd go to plays and do all of these other things, but when I got to the Bronx on 149th Street and Third Avenue, the hub, I've always heard about the Bronx, but the level of poverty was so very visible. I think I had reached out to you and to other people. There were people, K2, when I was coming out my building, in the office, I would cross over and actually shake them to make sure they were okay. Right? There were amputees because there's diabetes and all of these issues and poor health. There is no almond milk in the Bronx. I can't get almond milk in the Bronx when I go to get some coffee. Those are some of the issues that our young people are addressing because if we have a healthy intake, the outtake can also be healthy. So we're addressing issues as for food qualities and we're encouraging young people not just to look at the violence, but all of the other pieces of the puzzle that makes up a community. Thank you for a wonderful panel. My question is for Ms. Charles. I was deeply moved by your discussion of violence um, and the minority community in New York City. And I'm wondering about the reluctance to speak about it. If you care about mass incarceration, you have to care about violence. It's been about 20 years since drug arrests contributed to mass incarceration. The vast bulk of the growth in mass incarceration is overwhelmingly violence. Why then the reluctance to put these two issues together? I, I, I believe that there's fear um, to even bring them together. When we talk about massacre, you know, my table sometimes at home is Glenn Martin, Tamika Mallory having conversations and sitting together. As you know, Glenn is in this movement about close Rikers. There is, if we're to think about how violence plays a role, and I go back to what Jeff is saying, it's okay to the drug epidemic and to, to incarcerate individuals under Rockefeller law and all of that stuff, and RICO. However, the issue about poverty, and I hope I'm answering your question, the issue around poverty and addressing the needs and the resources of community is not something that is talked about whenever we talk about mass incarceration. It's all about punishment. It's all about punitive. It's not about healing. And I think that's why those conversations don't happen, right? We're fearful to start talking about how do we heal communities Instead, we talk about lock them up and put away the key. But eventually, they come home to communities that are not healed. What's that? <laughs> oh, a balloon. <laughs> and it's purple. It's royal. Thank you. Um, but I think that's the, that's the reason. There's a sense of nobody really wants to address the real issues, the existing history of violence in our community. Nobody wants to talk about that. Because then you're going to have to take ownership of some stuff. And folks ain't ready to take ownership, right? So it's easy to say, let's, let's, let's keep them separate. I, I, I think, if that, does that answer? Yeah, because that's the struggle I have sometimes. People come to me and talk about, oh, well, Ife, get, in reality check, do we really want to address the violence in our community? Because then we got to start talking about some stuff that's going to stink, and it's going to stink from here to high holy hell. And we're not ready to do that, because then people are going to feel all in their ways. They're going to want to act as though, oh, it wasn't me. But the trickle down effects is why we don't talk about it. We're not ready to deal with that stuff. It's emotional. So Hi. I think part of your question was about the conflation of, of drugs with violence. And I think the, there's a reluctance to, to persist in there because of the racial dynamics of that historically. I think currently too, one of the things, and again, I speak more about the, the national uh, discussions that I've been able to be a part of is that the conflation of drugs and gun violence, I think, is somewhat overwrought and, and that what we are, are over um, uh, amplified because what we see a lot is that or, or what people are telling me in other cities that they see a lot, it's about personal 
conflict, beef. It's not about territory. There's somewhat of a detente in terms of distribution territories. And that's why the social media stuff is, is playing such a big role, right? It's a slight against another group on, on social media, and that leads to, to gun violence. And that's where the police can serve it and, and communicate, hey, we caught this. This group is at risk. Go talk to these folks and make sure they're not going to get involved in that. Um, and, and I think one of the real opportunities, and, we're, and this I can speak to what I've seen in New York, to deal with this type of stuff at the community level is around restorative justice practices. And that there's real, um, you mentioned earlier that, that black and brown folks don't do well with therapy. But I think restorative justice is how black and brown communities over the long term have dealt as a community with these difficult issues. And where it's taking root in, in New York and it's, and it's gaining popularity, there are dozens of agencies around the country that are working on this. And I think they're really leading the conversation around how we address violence uh, collectively. And so that's a real, real promising practice for us to, to look towards. Okay. We have one more question. Um, it's not a question. My name is Cleopatra. I'm from Trinidad. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I came from a culture where you don't talk about it. And only when I got to this country, I realized it wasn't okay. And I got arrested for fighting back. And I encountered an institution called Sanctuary for Families that helped me put my life back together. And it's part of the solution. And as a result of my violence, my um, daughter is an angry 15-year-old. She goes therapy a lot. So I think domestic violence and gun violence are linked because it's just like an involvement of the violence from the fist to the gun. And um, people just need to be more comfortable talking about it for things to really change. And there are places like Sanctuary for Families that help you put your life back together. And I'm from the Manhattan Borough President Office, and I'm here to listen in and go back and share and if you guys need funding. Uh, okay. Everybody needs funding. I know, right? Well, I got to say to my fellow Trini, you know, I, I, I understand that, right? Um, yeah. Right? We, we, we didn't talk about violence. Right? I come from a Trini household also. That was not part of it. But uh, there was a point that I wanted to make as we talk about, when you talked about the restorative justice, please. When I talk about brown and black, this is not an ignorant statement. I want folks to be consciously aware of this. When black and brown folks get diagnosed with a mental illness, it is a mark against them, right? The stigmatism that is lined with that is real for us, right? You're ostracized by your family, you're ostracized by a community, and then you're labeled as problematic. We go to our faith as brown and black. When I told you my son passed away, all I did was went to, you know, it was God. I was Catholic, I was, you know, in my different paths of, of religion. But therapy wasn't something that I thought about. Even with my father and the violence that he created on our lives, that wasn't a conversation. Because what we heard was, you're crazy, right? And then you get labeled for the rest of your life. We don't have dainty pockets, and it's only now this is changing. And this is why I said when we talk about violence, folks don't really, really, really want to talk about it. Because then you start talking about race and class and privilege and entitlement, and that doesn't sit well with a lot of folks. It's only now brown and black people are opening up to therapy, right? So that we're not stopped from getting a job because we have a mental diagnosis. That we're now received in communities and it's okay to say that I go to therapy. Because before that was a fear, once you went to therapy, it meant that you were no longer whole. And so those are some of the issues. This is not just about black and brown people wanting to go out there and hurt each other. This is not what it is about. If we're gonna keep this real, we have to look historically and we have to be uncomfortable to talk about it. When black and brown children are disruptive, they get sent to the dean's office, they get locked up. When my white counterparts get, are disruptive, they get behavioral therapy, they go to modification, behavior modification schools where parents are paying 60 and 70 and $80,000 in prep school 
And I say that to you because my daughter was awarded the privilege of going to a prep school. Right? And when she would come home from me and she's like, Mom, many of my colleagues, many of my students are on medication and they flunked out of school, but their parents could afford to pay $50,000 for high school where there's only 12 students in the class. Eric and I both worked with the Department of Education. When we're in a classroom and there's 40 students and where 22 of them might be diagnosed with a behavioral problem, they don't get the opportunity to say, you know what? My dad or my mom is gonna write a check for 60,000 and put them in a school and no longer will they have that kind of racket. They'll change. Let's be real, and sometimes I, you know, Shayla and they, they know. The reality for me is if we're gonna talk about violence, we have to be uncomfortable. And we have to understand that black and brown people are not always awarded the privilege and the benefits that our white counterparts have. Because if your child picked up a gun and shot somebody, you'll be able to afford an attorney. Our kids can't. Our parents have to go to legal aid. And legal aid attorneys, as much as I love them, they are inundated with paperwork. We don't have those privileges. We don't have those entitlements. And when we try to usurp them, then we're looked upon and frowned upon as being out of order. That still lives in America. It still lives in New York. It is still something that we deal with. I said it before, and I'll continue to say this. When a black child dies, and their mother or their father cannot afford to bury them, and they have to stay above ground for 15 or 20 days because people are gathering money for them, we're not all on the same playing field. We're not all on the same playing field. And so opportunities like this, opportunities where we can come and talk about how do we deal with mass incarceration? How do we deal with violence? How, why is it we talk about police officers? Our brown and black babies, when they go to police officers, they don't feel safe. And so what are we doing? We're changing the norm. We're trying to change the ability for them to understand that they're not gonna get shot or gunned down. I tell my white counterparts all the time, I like the fact that you can say, I empathize but can you really feel what a black mama feels or a brown mama feels? Or a black father, thank you, Eric, I keep forgetting the brothers in the room, right? Or a black father, can you really feel that? Because when I see a little brown and black child, immediately I think about my 25-year-old daughter who's got a doggone good college education, George Washington, paid, hello. But at times, even though she has that, when I see a little 17 or the 21-year-old kid that got kid in the development that we work in, that we just saw her two days ago before she was shot in her head, my eyes immediately go to my daughter. That is the difference between my white and brown counterparts. That I can align my children as being someone who is going to be killed or shot. That when I say to her, walk and be safe, I have to say to be safe, not only from the brown people and the black people, but for white people also. That's real for me. And so if we're gonna talk about violence, we gotta get uncomfortable. We've gotta get uncomfortable. We gotta feel uncomfortable. And at the end, we gotta come together and not just talk about, because I love when people have all these meetings and talk about, oh, we're gonna go to meeting to meeting. What is the strategy? What is the strategy? Are my white counterparts willing to stand up and say when gentrification is happening, we're not going to rent that apartment until you make it equal for everybody else, or are you going to move in? What is the stand? So the same way I tell my brown and black people to take ownership, I tell my whites, take ownership. If we're going to make a change, it ain't about the fact that it's NYPD against communities. It's about communities and NYPD working together. It's about John Jay, it's about Mark Jay, it's about a collaborative, but it's also acknowledging that we're on two different playing fields. Okay, so that does have to be our, our, our powerful ending statement there from Ife, and thank you so much for that. Uh, let's give a hand to Eric, Ife, Jeff, and Shayla. I really appreciate the opportunity to, number one, be here in the presence of 
uh, all of you, and in particular Jeremy Travis, who uh, was uh, elevated to deity status last evening at the Plaza Hotel for his support and involvement uh, here at John Jay. I'm unbelievably privileged to be a, a trustee of John Jay, uh, as well as chairman of the Reisenbach Foundation, where uh, I'm honored that you know many of my colleagues and fellow board members of John Jay are here. Uh, when I was asked to just say a few words, like very few words, uh, uh, you know, today, uh, you know, I thought, you know, gun violence, et cetera, what, you know, what can I say about, you know, gun violence? And uh, I can only start by saying I grew up in the South Bronx uh, in the 1950s where uh, uh, there was a shot or two uh, going on, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, an Italian neighborhood outside of Fordham, but it was with the uh, the Fordham Baldies had their residence, which uh, was a group that owned the Bronx at the time. Uh, and then, uh, to assure I would get, you know, uh, some safety away from the Bronx, I, I spent four years in the Marine Corps, and could, including two years in Vietnam. So, uh, you know, the whole idea of, uh, uh, you know, I guess guns were Im embedded in my, you know, early existence. Uh, you know, the most important you know, notion I just wanted to import before everyone got back into their sandwiches, which I am looking forward to do myself, is that, uh, you know, how do you make a difference? And, and uh, I think you make a difference by, you know, participation. And uh, uh, I got involved in so many of these uh, entities that you were, you know, beginning to hear read off because I worked for a guy that, you know, I hate to say many of you probably don't know, but at least Google him so you understand who he is. And a television producer who is still alive and very active by the name of Norman Lear. And Norman Lear created All in the Family and Maud, and, and I worked for him. And while I was there, we produced uh, uh, three movies, Stand By Me, Princess Bride, and Fried Green Tomatoes. So his track record was kind of kind of good. We owned television stations. and I. He and I had lunch one day, and he created something called People for the American Way, uh, which uh, exists very actively today. And uh, I asked Norman, I said, listen, I said, I, you know, I put you on a pedestal because of, you know, all the things that you do. And uh, I said, what's the secret of your participation? And he said something to me that I, you know, think about practically on a daily basis, which is why, you know, my bio is too long in terms of involvement. He, he said, Jerry he said, you know, let me tell you one thing. He said, life is not a rehearsal. And man, did that you know, resonate, you know, and uh, it just said, you know, life is not a rehearsal. You know, it can end, you know, in a heart attack. It can end with a gunshot. It can end in so many ways and, and to, uh, waste the time that one has here uh, would be just a terrible shame. I mean, uh, the comments that were made uh, in the last panel that I was listening to uh, were great because I listened to, you know, four people who were on fire about, you know, issues and finding answers and, and kind of like the Reisenbach Foundation, which was begun over 25 years ago, you know, in a random act of violence when, uh, a young man that many of us uh, were friends with, uh, his life ended uh, on the corner of Hudson and Jane Street when he, you know, didn't have a cell phone because they didn't exist, wound up on a telephone booth on the corner and <clears throat> in a random act of violence, <clears throat> gun violence, I add, was uh, taken away from us. And then a group in the advertising, marketing, media business came together to create this Reisenbach Foundation with the whole idea of, you know, uh, making New York a safer and better place. Very, very simple. And to find organizations that we, you know, can and uh, will, you know, support whose mandate is exactly that, make New York a safer and better place. And we have, have the privilege to, you know, uh, support many organizations and have the double privilege of here at John Jay, you know, having, you know, uh, scholarships attached to, uh, 
uh, individuals who are deserving recipients. So uh, our engagement and involvement with John Jay is uh, something that we have great pride in. Uh, you know, in many of the areas that were outlined, uh, uh, you know, you, you may have noted or not. I'm, I'm very involved with veterans because of my time, you know, in the Marine Corps. And, uh, you know, what will be announced very soon is that we're creating John Jay, Fordham, and all the other colleges in New York, public and private, a consortium that's called Veterans on Campus. And, you know, why are we doing that? Because, believe it or not, in New York City, there are 12,000 veterans attending New York City schools, undergraduate and graduate, you know. Uh, 12,000 veterans, and uh, I'll give you another crazy statistic. Uh, those 12,000 veterans for the city of New York are worth close to a billion dollars. 12,000 veterans, New York City, one billion dollars. That's because of the GI Bill money they bring in, their families who come and reside here. Uh, and these are veterans who uh, will indeed make a difference. So the idea of the schools coming together, you know, led by John Jay, uh, it, it's important because these are, you know, young men uh, and women who indeed will make a difference for the city of New York. And, but in a broader perspective, just so you, know, the, you, you look at 12,000 individuals and think that that's still a small number, uh, you got to remember that there are 23,000 veterans in the United States. There are two and a half million on active duty, and the family unit is about four. Now, you, you do the math, that's 110 million people. That's not one half of 1%. That's one third of the country. So, you know, the thing that I'm very proud of is, you know, with John Jay and, you know, as a, a, a member of the Reisenbach Foundation that we've recognized a community that, you know, can and will make a difference, uh, which I think, again, is what, you know, you know, Norman said to me at, at, at lunch that day, you know, uh, you know, life is indeed not a rehearsal. So uh, I, I promise to be brief and mercifully brief. And I, I thank you for being here. I thank you for uh, making sure that life is not a rehearsal. I want to thank my colleagues at Reisenbach for, you know, being here and, and Jeremy Travis, who we elevated like, into deity status last evening. and who has been an inspired leader here at John Jay for being here and taking you know, a few moments that I feel very honored by your presence. So thank you, everyone.